So I'll open the session now. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Alec Farker. I'm coming to you from Toronto, Ontario. I'm on the International Board of Workplace Health Without Borders. And I'm very, very proud to be an active member of our asbestos working group, which has put together this series of three webinars starting today, then continuing on June 21st and finishing off on July 12th. The webinars are very simple in concept. Today's webinar will deal with the extent of asbestos exposure and disease in the world and some characteristics of it, including the frontline perspective. The June 21st webinar will focus on controls, prevention, substitution, and all the different things that can be done about asbestos, including advocacy. And then on July 12th, because Workplace Health Without Borders and involves so many occupational health and safety professionals around the world, we are going to have a more technical session looking at issues such as the details of detection of asbestos containing materials, how to test for them, and how to deal with some of the more specific situations that come up. So this is meant to be quite a comprehensive review of this very serious issue in the world. Now in Canada, and I guess in some other countries around the world, we start events with what we call a land acknowledgement. And that land acknowledgement has to do with the fact that we are on the land that has been occupied for many thousands of years by uh, people who were originally here, our indigenous peoples. So in my case, I'm coming from Toronto. That's on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Now, in my own case, I'm on a place called Toronto Island, which is in the harbor off Toronto. And our community has had the great privilege of building an ongoing relationship, specifically with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I learned an awful lot from that relationship and I acknowledge it as being very important. I also want for purposes of today's webinar to acknowledge the tremendous damage that asbestos itself has done to Indigenous peoples in Canada, many of whom have been living in homes containing asbestos insulation, and unfortunately, some of whom have gotten mesothelioma from it. So uh, very relevant to today's activities. I want to uh, turn over things for a minute to Marianne Levitsky, one of our founders of Workplace Health Without Borders. Marianne is a senior occupational hygienist in our province of Ontario and in Canada, active in many national and international levels as a consultant and uh, she'll be telling you a little bit about Workplace Health Without Borders and then we'll hand it back to me to introduce our, our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Alec, and welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, I am encouraging people to say hello in the chat and say we are, where you are from. We have a very international audience today. And uh, as Alex said, I'm one of the founders, but we have several others on the line, including O'Malley, Kevin Hedges, and also our current president is here, Jennifer Galvin. Uh, so uh, we do welcome everyone. Just a few words about WHWB. We are an all volunteer organization headquartered in Canada with branches in the UK, US, Australia, starting one in Africa. Uh, we do training in occupational health and hygiene. We have a healthcare providers group. So I know there's a lot of healthcare providers on the call. You're very welcome to join that. Uh, we do projects to uh, assess and control hazards in many parts of the country. Uh, we have working groups as, on asbestos, as you now know, uh, on waste workers, on brick kilns, uh, and interested in, in several others as well. So please do find out more about us on our website. You're very welcome to join. Everyone can join. Uh, there's no fee for joining. Uh, you can also sign up for our mailing list on our website. We do encourage you to donate. Uh, we put on many educational events, including webinars like this, usually at no cost. Uh, but we do need to keep the lights on and Zoom in business and all those other things. So please do uh, donate if possible. I will put links in the chat. The other thing too is you can get a certificate or you will get a certificate of attendance uh, if you attend this whole webinar. Um, and uh, there will be uh, information in the chat uh, about that. 
And also the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel. So if you have any questions about WHWB, I'd be very happy to answer them. Uh, you can message me in the chat or get in touch with me later. Uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to this webinar. And thanks very much to the asbestos working group who planned it. Back to you, Alex. Thanks very much, Marianne. I also uh, want to explain the timing of today's event. It's a bit tough on people in North America and Latin America because on the west coast of those continents, it's very, very early in the morning. And I want to say a special thank you to the people who gotten up at 3.30 in the morning to attend this event. And it was a very conscious decision because we wanted to make sure that globally speaking, this webinar was accessible and at a good time of day for people who are most affected by asbestos uh, ongoing uh, current exposures and current uses. And I think we've succeeded in doing that from seeing the chat. I'm seeing people from all over the world. It's thrilling to be part of something this significant at this time in our world when we really are all addressing uh, uh, common issues. I want to review the, the program for today very briefly, then I'll introduce Asani. And today's program uh, is intended to provide a solid overview of the dimensions of the problem that we're facing. So we're going to start with a presentation from a distinguished uh, occupational physician, Dr. Arthur Frank of Drexel University, will be introduced by Asani. And Arthur will be speaking to the health impacts of asbestos exposure. And uh, in the case of the developing medical science, some health impacts that many people, even in uh, professional capacity, much less the public, might not be fully aware of the extent of these impacts. Then Arthur will participate in a panel moderated by Asani and with Dr. Priyanka Roy of India on the challenges to diagnosing asbestos-related diseases in developing countries, uh, which is a real focus of, of our work. Then at 7.55, we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Marc de Perot, originally from Belgium, now in Canada, who is uh, going to present on mesothelioma specifically. And again, some breakthroughs that are happening in early detection and treatment, even including a possible mesothelioma vaccine. And uh, I'll be introducing Dr. de Perot, who I work with very actively. At 8.20, we're going to have Dr. Paul Demare, who's the director of the Ontario Occupational Cancer Research Center and has many other uh, distinguished connections around the world. And he'll be looking at the global impact of asbestos on cancer and other diseases from an epidemiological viewpoint. We'll finish off the session at starting at 8.45 with a panel moderated by Dr. David Goldsmith of George Washington University. And that panel is going to deal with the frontline realities of asbestos exposure. And what we're trying to do here is to give people a snapshot of the real situation that has to be addressed in a constructive, professional, and organized fashion as we strive to uh, ultimately ban asbestos, obviously, but also to make sure that there's a transition that works for the countries where it's currently in use. So it's an ambitious day. Everyone's really going to strive, strive to stay on time. We might have a final um, unpredictable intervention because today happens to be uh, by total coincidence the final day of a big criminal trial in northern Italy in a town called Novara which deals with exposures that happened in an area of the country around Casale Monferrato where 392 people died of mesothelioma from exposures to um, uh, essentially asbestos in some asbestos cement and the verdict in that trial, trial of the owner of the company and the CEO was, is going to be announced today and literally may be being announced as we're speaking right this minute. So we're hoping to have a brief report on that as part of the final panel. And if we keep on time, there will be question period and a chance for discussion, but we're going to have to leave questions for uh, the end. What I will do is harvest the questions as we go along and strive to uh, get them answered. And in some cases, we might be able to get them answered uh, as these sessions are going on, if, if, as long as the presenters know that those questions are out there. So I'll try when introducing various people to highlight uh, questions that have come up so that they, they can be addressed along the way as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Saini. And uh, Saini uh, uh, Wikramilate, 
and I think I just mispronounced again, Wikram, Wikramatila, okay, is a medical doctor supporting occupational health and hygiene in Sri Lanka. Uh, it's been a privilege getting to know Asani, who's been very active with our working group. And Asani, I'll hand it over to you to introduce our first speaker and uh, take it from there. Thank you, Alec. And it is my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Arthur Frank. I've known him for, for quite some time now. So it's a very brief introduction. So Arthur has trained in Mount Sinai with Dr. Selikoff and for more than 50 years, he has worked on asbestos issues. So his asbestos work has taken him to countries like India, China, Sri Lanka, where I met him, and Mongolia, Brazil, Colombia, and many others. So actually, if we look at all the scientific journals, we can see so many uh, articles published by him and his work speaks for all the great achievements he has done. Over to you, Arthur. Thank you so much, Aseni, and uh, what she neglected to share with you that she and I have uh, published together from work in Sri Lanka. And uh, as I've uh, come online this morning, it's so nice to see so many of my friends and colleagues from around the world that I have uh, uh, gotten to know, and I've had the privilege of, of working in many of these countries, uh, as Aseni uh, just uh, shared with you. I'm going to share my screen and pull up my slides. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the issue of uh, asbestos uh, and the diseases that it causes and uh, anticipating uh, the uh, discussion we'll be having with uh, Dr. Roy and with uh, Seni as well on uh, uh, the challenges of uh, making the diagnosis. So a little bit by way of history, you know, as you heard, uh, uh, I've been in the asbestos world since 1968 when I started uh, with Dr. Solikoff at Mount Sinai. And uh, again, just by way of a, a bit of a background for, you know, I'm sure everybody is uh, concerned about the issue, but just a little background about uh, uh, what we're talking about. Asbestos is a commercial term. It, it comes from a Greek word that means unquenchable. Uh, it uh, is a naturally occurring material. Nobody makes asbestos. It's uh, found in rock deposits and it's found admixed with other materials. Uh, it's been found in talc deposits, vermiculite deposits and others. Uh, which have led to serious uh, health issues. And it comes in two families of uh, fibers. There are five amphiboles. Uh, these are somewhat straight and needle-like in their uh, presentation. Um, only two of them have been commercially important. That's been chrysidolite, the blue asbestos, and amosite, the brown asbestos. Uh, they together have made up only about 5% of the world's use of asbestos. Uh, it's been used uh, in some settings more than others. Aboard ship, for example, amosite uh, uh, was used because of its, some of its properties. But most of the asbestos used in the world has been of the white asbestos variety, the serpentine we call chrysotile. And that's been a source of uh, considerable uh, uh, concern and considerable controversy, which I'm going to try to put to bed this morning. Uh, because there are those, uh, especially those in the market selling the material, who call it, uh, heaven help us, the safe asbestos. Uh, clearly, there is no such thing. The reason it's called serpentine is if you look at it uh, uh, under the microscope, it's sort of wavy, looks more like a, uh, a snake or a worm might. So it has the name, the serpentine uh, form of asbestos. So that, by way of brief introduction, is what we're talking about. And uh, we should note that uh, over the years, some three to 5,000 different products uh, have made use of asbestos. Much of it over the time has gone into construction materials. Its major use uh, continuing is in construction materials, asbestos cement, but it's been widely used aboard ships and in many other settings. This is a slide of an autopsy done in the year 1899 and sort of in the middle, a bit to the right, a little bit obscured, 
uh, is uh, maybe I can, oh there. Uh, this is a, uh, a an asbestos body. This was from an autopsy uh, done by Dr. Montague Murray on a gentleman about 36 years old uh, who reported to him before he died that uh, he and nine mates, 10 young men, had begun working at an asbestos textile factory at the east end of London. And uh, he reported to Dr. Murray that uh, he was the 10th and last to die all within 10 years of respiratory insufficiency. Uh, Dr. Murray did this autopsy and uh, uh, found these uh, structures, uh, which he didn't know quite what to call them, so he called them curious bodies. Uh, we'll get back to Dr. Murray in just a little bit. This is a slide with the, sort of the global use of uh, asbestos from a few years ago. It's changed a little bit. But still, uh, the majority of asbestos right now in the world uh, is used in two countries, India and China. Brazil has now fortunately banned the use of asbestos, though they're still dealing with that issue in the courts. Uh, it is used, as you see, in a number of other countries, many of them in uh, Asia. Interestingly enough, Russia, which is the major producer at this point, uh, tends not to use uh, uh, all that much of it. Uh, but it's also mined uh, actively still in Kazakhstan, and the Chinese market uh, with its own mines has grown as well. Uh, so there's still uh, somewhere around a million tons uh, a year being mined and, and shipped around the world. The World Health Organization has estimated that each year there are some, uh, the numbers vary, but between 230 and 250, maybe even a bit more, but about 250,000 asbestos-related deaths. Here in the United States, uh, uh, we probably have about 40,000 deaths a year. Uh, the records, as we'll talk in a minute, are much better in uh, some countries than others. Uh, Western Europe has good record-keeping, other parts of the world uh, less so. But the estimate is that, that uh, uh, this large number of people die each year from asbestos-related disease. About 70 countries have now totally banned the use of asbestos. Unfortunately, the country I reside in, the United States, is the only industrialized country and the only country that uh, uh, really ought to have banned it that hasn't. It's still a legal product here, which is uh, quite unfortunate. Uh, there's been a bill in our Congress uh, for some years uh, trying to ban it that uh, keeps running into difficulty. And the irony is we don't even import that much asbestos anymore. From its peak in 1973 of 803,000 tons, we're down to two or 3,000 tons that we import, though we don't know uh, how much uh, asbestos comes in in other products, such as roofing materials, brakes, and uh, other things that uh, may contain asbestos. Um, but uh, whereas many countries in the world have, have recognized the extreme hazard of this material, uh, while we recognize the hazard in this country, we are uh, not yet able to uh, do what many other countries have done. And there's a simple question, does stopping the use uh, of asbestos stop disease? And the resounding answer, of course, is yes. We know that from the data. Uh, the first country that ever banned asbestos was Iceland, interestingly enough. Sweden followed soon thereafter. And if you look at the Swedish mesothelioma data, uh, over the 30 years of the ban, the rates of mesotheliomas uh, continue to go down. Uh, mesotheliomas have what we call a long tail from the time of exposure until the disease occurs. We'll have some data on that in a little bit. Uh, it could be 50 or 60 years or longer. So even banning uh, it in a country today uh, means that there will still be disease. However, it'll be going down over the next uh, uh, several generations of people where it'll still be uh, around as a disease because of the long latency period. The other thing that we need to recognize is that uh, data collection is poor. As I mentioned, it's, it's pretty good in places like the United States and Western Europe. Uh, and an old public health adage states that the absence of data does not mean the absence of disease. And we need to keep that in mind. Uh, we'll get back to that issue uh, in a bit. So getting back to Dr. Montague Murray, after... Uh, 
having done this autopsy and having uh, considered the hazards of asbestos, uh, the first major modern publication was in 1898. Her Majesty's Inspector of Factories talked about the hazards of asbestos. He wrote, one hears, generally speaking, that considerable trouble is now taken to prevent the inhalation of dust, and so the disease is not so likely to occur as heretofore. It's a long way of saying uh, more than 100 years ago, they appreciated that this was a hazardous material, that we understood this, and that uh, we shouldn't have a problem. But here we are in the 21st century, uh, uh, more than 100 years later, and we know that there is this continuing spectrum of asbestos-related disease. There are uh, two groups of diseases, as I like to think about them. There's the non-malignant diseases, and this includes asbestos warts. It gets into the skin, causes some irritation, not a significant health problem and pretty uncommon. The first issue that shows up within the first 10 years is something called benign asbestotic pleural effusion. Uh, what this is, is an irritation of the pleura by fibers, uh, one of the characteristics of asbestos fibers is that they easily translocate around the body. And in many of the tissues uh, in, in which disease occurs, you can find them. We also know, for example, that asbestos can even cross the placenta and enter uh, a fetus uh, before it's born. So it really has this ability to uh, translocate. But when it gets to the pleura early on, it will cause the, a fluid buildup. It's a bloody fluid. It scares the clinician because you're sure there's a cancer in there, but you can't find the cancer. And it tends to clear up, uh, uh, usually without uh, too much by way of treatment. The major problem, of course, with uh, asbestos exposure of a non-malignant disease is the disease asbestosis one of the so-called pneumoconioses or dust diseases of the lung. Those were first described by a German pathologist by the name of Zenker in 1867. Uh, and uh, asbestosis you know, joins silicosis and black lung co-workers pneumoconiosis and talcosis and many, many other dusts uh, in terms of uh, disease. And in some groups, uh, for example, uh, asbestos insulators here in the United States, where this has been studied, 20% uh, of them have, uh, I'm sorry, 10% of them have died of asbestosis. So while a non-cancerous disease, it doesn't mean it's not deadly. And people around the world still are dying from this scarring of the lung that prevents the difficulty of oxygen traversing from uh, inside the lung in the air sacs into the bloodstream because of the thickening of tissue. The other significant set of diseases uh, that come from asbestos exposure are a whole variety of malignancies. Uh, lung cancer is the major one. Uh, we'll mention about its interaction with smoking. Then there are mesotheliomas, 90% uh, of them. They, these are lining tissues, primarily in the chest and abdomen. 90% of mesotheliomas occur in the chest, called pleural mesotheliomas. Uh, about 10% occur in the abdomen, peritoneal mesotheliomas. Uh, there's uh, lining tissue around the heart, about 1% or maybe a little less of the pericardial. And there's even testicular mesotheliomas, a small number that occur in males. There's also a growing body of evidence of gastrointestinal tract cancers, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, colorectal cancer. And then there's laryngeal cancer, various oropharyngeal cancers, kidney cancer, and in women, ovarian cancer. <clears throat> so what's, what's interesting about asbestos is this ability to cause many, many different kinds of cancers. Uh, and in some populations, such again as the asbestos insulators, 50% um, of them will die of an asbestos-related disease. And in other populations, I've uh, last year published with colleagues in Libby, Montana, with the uh, contaminated vermiculite, and 50% of uh, people in Libby uh, were dying of one or another asbestos-related disease. So it's uh, a serious problem. Uh, I mentioned smoking uh, related to cigarettes uh, and, and asbestos because we know about this data, there's a synergistic effect uh, or multiplicative effect. If you don't smoke and don't work with asbestos, you have a very low risk of getting lung cancer, uh, 11 per 100,000. We'll take that as a baseline of one. 
If you work with asbestos but don't smoke, you have a five-fold increased risk of getting lung cancer. If you're a smoker, the average one-pack-a-day smoker who doesn't work with asbestos, you have about a 10 or 11-fold increased risk. But if you're an asbestos worker who smokes, it's not additive, 5 plus 10. It turns out there's data that shows that it can be multiplicative. More recent data is not quite uh, as strong as this, though you can find uh, uh, similar data, the Surgeon General's report, if you're a two-pack-a-day smoker, it's not 50 times, but 80 times. Clearly, anybody who works with asbestos uh, must be urged not to also be a smoker. The other issue that comes up is which of the fibers cause disease? And this is work from Dr. Wagner from South Africa uh, originally. Uh, this is work he did in Great Britain after he was thrown out of South Africa after reporting uh, mesotheliomas being re related to uh, asbestos. And as you see here, the so-called safe asbestos, Canadian chrysotile, caused as many lung cancers and as many mesotheliomas as the chrysotile, which some say uh, is the most hazardous of the asbestos types. So the data really doesn't support this. And while it's a legitimate scientific question as to the relative potency of different fiber types, there is absolutely no question whatsoever that all fiber types, including the chrysotile that's been widely used around the world, um, predominantly uh, can cause uh, lung cancers and mesotheliomas as well, of course, as asbestosis. The other logical question is, well, how much asbestos does it take to produce disease? And the same study that Dr. Wagner did showed that as little as one day of exposure in animals gave rise to both lung cancers and mesotheliomas. And there are uh, scientific reports in the literature and other cases that I uh, am aware of, uh, at least five uh, of individuals with a single day of exposure, uh, one here in uh, Pennsylvania, one uh, that I know of in uh, uh, the UK, a pair of sisters that worked in a shipyard for one day during World War II found it so dusty and dirty, they left, had no other exposures, both came down with mesothelioma, a case from Australia, that one day will give you mesothelioma. And as you see here, generally, as you increase the amount of exposures, uh, the uh, risk of disease goes up, which is the classic uh, uh, concept of the dose mix, the poison, or the dose-response relationship. For lung cancer, we know that working a month or less doubles your risk. This is work uh, that Dr. Solokoff did uh, at an asbestos factory in New Jersey. And by the time workers worked there for two years, uh, they had a sevenfold increased risk of developing lung cancer. The other question, of course, is when do, do the cancers occur? And as I mentioned, there's a long tail or a long latency period. Disease begins to occur generally around 10 years. There are some case reports, very rare, but there are case reports of shorter periods of exposure. But as you see, the peak for lung cancer and mesotheliomas don't occur for 35, 40, 45 years. So uh, we're talking uh, on average uh, many, many decades till these diseases peak. And I have seen disease in a 90-year-old who first was exposed uh, at the age of 18 or so uh, with the first exposure to asbestos. So unfortunately, you never outlive your risk uh, of developing an asbestos-related disease. So let's turn to uh, the international scene. Uh, we're in a one-world marketplace now, Globot. We have to produce to the same high standards around the globe. What about health and safety standards? Ah, that depends on which part of the world you work in. And I've had the privilege, uh, as you heard earlier, of, of being in many countries and seeing uh, working conditions uh, in many places. This was a, an asbestos uh, brake manufacturing facility in China. They take the shiny new brakes and they scuff them up so that uh, the surface will actually stop the vehicle. These ladies are wearing cotton gauze masks, which of course are not going to keep out uh, uh, any asbestos fibers. This was the textile part of the plant. The asbestos material was, was uh, you know, not well handled and again, not uh, proper protection. Uh, I could be showing you pictures from uh, many parts of the world that uh, show similar kinds of things. 
With regard to uh, asbestos disease, we know that worldwide asbestos disease uh, is greatly undercounted, uh, and there's reasons for this. Uh, we're going to talk more about this, but there are diagnostic difficulties, and uh, I'll save some of these comments uh, to discuss with Dr. Roy and with uh, uh, my colleague Aseni, uh, but there are reasons for uh, diagnostic difficulties. We also need to know that in trying to continue to sell uh, asbestos, uh, that there are significant uh, bits of misinformation, what I call science for sale, uh, where uh, people mischaracterize uh, the hazards of asbestos. So we've already mentioned the so-called chrysotile It is not the safe asbestos. There's also the issue of so-called safe use uh, people claim that there is the safe use of asbestos. A uh, study in Canada some years ago, they looked at where, where there are very strict uh, regulations about its use. Ten workplaces were looked at. Nine didn't meet the requirements. And if you didn't meet them in a country like Canada with strict rules, I can assure you in other countries, such as some of the places I've seen in Asia, uh, there is no such thing as safe use. There's also the tissue lie. That is to say that something is a case of asbestosis. You have to find certain uh, numbers of uh, asbestos bodies uh, or certain numbers of fibers. This doesn't recognize that chrysotile, the major uh, fiber type used, is very different in terms of uh, uh, its migration out of the lung, which is where people tend to look. It also doesn't form asbestos bodies readily, which the amphiboles do. So there is the tissue lie. And then one that I don't have here, uh, even in, in India, where I've been uh, many, many times and have done work there for over 20 years now, um, the Indian asbestos industry claims that they don't have mesotheliomas there uh, because Indians genetically are different than uh, Western uh, Europeans and Americans, which of course is uh, another lie since we share probably 99.999% of our genes. And there's nothing special about uh, the genetics of an Indian versus uh, a European. Uh, and we, we certainly know that there are plenty of mesotheliomas uh, in India. So why is the epidemiological data uh, lacking? Well, some of it is lack of resources. Some countries just don't uh, uh, keep track of uh, or have the resources to keep track of, of the cases. Uh, they may not have good cancer registries. Uh, there uh, may be lack of resources at the individual hospitals or cancer registries or at a national level. On the other hand, there's some deliberate uh, uh, reasons for not collecting data. Some years ago in India, the NIOH, National Institute of Occupational Health, uh, had not recorded a single case of mesothelioma, yet I knew in that year that I was there looking into this that 32 cases had uh, appeared in, in one hospital in uh, Mumbai, at a cancer hospital. So there seemed to be some deliberate not recording. The Russians now have stopped uh, uh, recording mesothelioma deaths. They're not using the ICD-9 or 10 coding, rather, uh, coding system. So they deliberately are just not recording mesotheliomas, and they blithely tell the world, we don't have any mesotheliomas. There are radiological issues uh, regarding what is asbestosis. Nobody disagrees that it's parenchymal change. There's discussions about, is it asbestos or asbestosis if it's plural change? Uh, I make a case for, uh, as I was taught by Dr. Solikoff, that there's a disease we could call plural asbestosis. I don't care what you call it. If you want to use the term asbestos-related plural disease, that's fine. Uh, that also came about where they tried to uh, stop calling plural disease asbestosis so that uh, compensation issues in the United States uh, particularly uh, would not need to compensate uh, uh, for plural disease. Uh, we can talk about uh, this with uh, Dr. Roy and with uh, Aseni in terms of pathologic issues. Um, uh, some of the difficulty in making a diagnosis is competing etiology. It's all too easy in a smoker to say, well, uh, smoking caused the lung cancer and ignore the asbestos. And some uh, 
so-called scientists even come to court and claim it's 100% due to smoking and asbestos in an asbestos exposed individual uh, has no uh, role. And uh, for my last comment, uh, not only do we know that stopping the use of asbestos stops disease, but prevention is still the best approach to uh, uh, keeping people safe. And we know, and as uh, Alec uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, in a future session, they're going to talk about asbestos substitutes. Those have been found to be as simple as uh, the fibers from plant material, or in one case, I know of an asbestos substitute that was literally shredded newspaper, uh, and that if you can get away from uh, the use of asbestos uh, is still the best approach. So thank you for uh, hearing me out. And uh, uh, I think we've kept on time and, and perhaps can move on to the next part of the session. Yes, Arthur, four minutes to go. Thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. And if we proceed with the next uh, panel discussion, I think I think it just takes on us from your uh, introduction to the whole asbestos scenario, how, how it affects our health into the discussion, what we see mainly in this part of the world. So for that, let me first introduce uh, Priyanka Roy. Priyanka is, a, is an ILO trained occupational health professional with more than eight years of work experience in both the government and the corporate in occupational health. health. She's, she's qualified as an MBBS, then uh, went on to get her MPH, Masters in Public Health, then Masters in Occupational Safety and Health, and a PhD in Social and Community Health. And uh, proud to say that she is the first female certified medical of, uh, chief inspector of the labor department in West Bengal in India. So, and currently looking after about 18,000 factories of their compliance. So that is a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Roy. And uh, I'm not going to reintroduce uh, Dr. Arthur and myself, Alec mentioned, I'm an occupational health uh, practitioner and also interested in hygiene in Sri Lanka, trying to uplift Sri Lanka's occupational health. Thank you, Asheni. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Dr. Priyanka Roy from India. And thank you, Workplace Health Without Border, for giving me this opportunity to talk about the challenges to diagnosing asbestos-related disease in developing country. And I'm going to talk about the scenario from India. So being in a government statutory body, my responsibility is to uh, keep the workers healthy and free from occupational disease. Under my jurisdiction, there are 18,000 factories present and among uh, those, only three asbestos factories are now manufacturing asbestos sheets for roofing purposes. Now there are very, uh, there are many challenges. What I found while dealing with the compliance of those asbestos factories, uh, number one, as uh, Dr. Frank said, neither a registry or sur surveillance program of asbestos related diseases or cancers exist. Because of the remote geographical locations, the workers from those factories, those asbestos factories, they cannot have access to government hospitals for their illness. And the population of that uh, particular district, which is Posi uh, Medinipur, uh, as named, uh, is approximately 8 million as per 2023 data. And only one medical college is situated there. So you can imagine that how uh, this only one medical college caters the whole population of that particular area, including those mm -hmm. as workers uh, in asbestos factories. And the occupational health centers in those factories, they are not functional because there is no doctor qualified doctor who can identify the problem associated with asbestos fibers. The next, as we don't have any registry of illness related to asbestos fiber exposure, it is not possible to understand the magnitude of the problem because we don't have any data. I have no data on that there is single patient with mesothelioma or any other cancer related to asbestos fiber. We do not have any occupational hygienist in any government setup to undertake surveys and evaluate 
risk to health in the work and during covid 19 almost all factories they had stopped doing the screening of workers since friends in 2020 so there is a big gap in that periodicity of screening of workers also the part of the legal compliance of under factories act 1948 every employer from a hazardous factory must do the uh, x ray of all workers all workers including casual worker and permanent workers in every 3 years and pulmonary function test in every year the employers are maintaining this just for the sake of legal obligation so sometimes they have the reports they have the extra plates but as a doctor i cannot read those uh, extra plates and this is not possible to identify if there is any problem now in reality most of the x rays are very are not uh, readable and and you know that this is only chest radiograph is inadequate as a sole clinical tool to diagnose ard most to come coming to uh, the lack of safe, uh, the safety culture this is lacking and uh, there is uh, for example industries are not very much cooperative for workers in terms of safety and health periodical health examination or screening that is a costly affair for the employers and they are seeking any opportunity if they can skip the health screening like for example I, as i said during pandemic so pandemic was in 2020 and after that 2021 very few factories had started with the screening program also um, in india also the practice is to engage workers from the unorganized sector at the most hazardous and risk prone zone so casual workers they are engaged in the most hazardous environment from my experience these casual workers work at the site where old broken seats of asbestos are pulverized for reusing and those dust is stored in bags everywhere like you can see everywhere that dust uh, containing sacks are present inside the asbestos factory another example is putting them in housekeeping so when one casual worker he is putting uh, in that job and he is using broom for that housekeeping so you know without using any pp so you can understand how they are exposed to directly toward that fibers and it's prevalent in all three factories i have seen everywhere now moreover the health checker for those casual workers are not been taken care of by the owner of factories but practically this is the they are abide by law that every worker anybody is present in that factory premises under factories act 1948 the employer is uh, this is their compulsion to do health check up for every worker so this is kind of thing we we are like uh, doing compliance thing and there are litigations for not abiding this also the awareness if we uh, talk about the awareness among the workers so they don't know about the exact threat or consequences after exposure towards that fiber so everywhere you can see that dust is there and then uh, they are working inside that factory without using any pp and coming to the challenges to diagnose ard is lack of training and knowledge among doctor causing the misdiagnosis of asbestos related diseases also the practice of doing uh, diagnosis and treatment without asking any question related to occupational history so that is the just asking them what is your occupation and where do you work that that is more uh, practical and it should be done but you know the in government setup how overburdened are doctors and there is a uh, no way we can get the occupational history from those uh, workers the importance of asking occupational history is not part of clinical training for doctors in india and that is why we often miss the diagnosis so 
those are the challenges what I found during my experience in while I visit uh, that asbestos factories. And uh, I will show some pictures in the closing panel discussion and uh, so that you can have some idea of what is going on actually in those factories. So th thank you, Priyanka, for that. And uh, Arthur, would you like to go and uh, talk about your experiences maybe in South America and in uh, China? Yes, and, and even a comment or two about India as well, where I've <clears throat> visited uh, about three dozen times over 20 years. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Roy uh, in, in pretty much everything she said. Uh, and it, unfortunately, it's not only just the industry that doesn't want to see uh, data collected, but even government agencies that are tasked with that and the very concrete example I'm going to give is a number of years ago, uh, the NIOH uh, in uh, Ahmedabad uh, commissioned a study to look for asbestosis and asbestos-related disease among asbestos workers. However, the research was funded by the industry. The protocol was written by the industry. The population that was studied generally had 10 years or less of exposure, which meant uh, the latency period to develop disease hadn't occurred. And they put out a report that said, we didn't find it, uh, any disease. They also didn't go to look uh, at uh, former workers or retired workers who would have been much more likely. Uh, I agree with Dr. Roy that the history is important. And it's not only in India that Doctors are not taught to take occupational histories. That is almost a universal finding around the world. Uh, Ramazzini, the father of occupational medicine uh, in 1700, wrote that, that you should ask of the common people what it is you do for a living, and yet we don't get trained uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, I think Dr. Roy has uh, outlined and highlighted the manpower uh, issue the fact that there aren't enough trained physicians, there aren't industrial hygienists. Uh, we're actually uh, having a conference uh, in New Delhi in November where one of the uh, three uh, days is going to be spent uh, in large part on looking at manpower in Southeast Asia issues, uh, that we need more physicians, we need industrial hygienists and safety people. The other comments I'd like to make have to do with the diagnostic criteria. Uh, I, I, I will disagree just slightly that if you're doing screening exams, I think a chest X-ray uh, is sufficient to screen populations. The reason I say that is, is CT scans are uh, uh, much more expensive. They're, they're uh, more, more radiation. Uh, they require uh, uh, proper interpretation. And one of the problems is that radiologists uh, Many in many parts of the world haven't been properly trained to read uh, either x-rays or CTs. Uh, our experience in Colombia, where I've been working for a number of years, uh, uh, led to myself and a couple of colleagues, occupational physicians knowledgeable about asbestos, uh, to put on a several-day course to train uh, a group of radiologists uh, in Bogota uh, to become more familiar with the ILO classification, not only for asbestosis and, and asbestos disease, but, but other dust diseases as well. So there's a lack of, of uh, good training uh, everywhere. Uh, but again, if one uh, spends time educating radiologists and occupational physicians and pulmonologists, more people can become knowledgeable about what to look for. So that certainly is a problem. Uh, the other issue is uh, the lack of appropriate training and resources for pathologists. Uh, pathologists will tell you that looking through the microscope, there may be some difficulty in sorting out what is, uh, let's say, an adenocarcinoma or the appearance of a mesothelioma. It's not always as clear as they might like, and so you need some special stains. Uh, and so pathologists around the world have not had a lot of experience looking at mesotheliomas, and, and it's clear that there are uh, many misdiagnoses of uh, uh, mesotheliomas as other cancers. Uh, so when it comes to making the proper diagnosis of asbestos-related disease, uh, 
uh, we have these three problems really of not getting an appropriate history of exposure and you can't really use job category you really have to ask a worker what kinds of materials do you work with because uh, things like asbestos obviously will show up in an asbestos cement factory, but they may not show up as uh, a product in uh, other settings. Uh, so you have to ask about that. We also know that some workers work directly with asbestos. Others are only bystanders. So again, you have to ask something about in what settings do they work? Thirdly, you may have family members, uh, wives and children who get disease because of what we know to be take-home exposure. Uh, and so you ask uh, uh, a woman with a mesothelioma, uh, you know, did you ever work with asbestos? And of course, uh, she may well say no, since in many places, few women have been exposed occupationally to asbestos. Uh, but that's not the question to be asked, you have to follow that up with, did anybody else in the household work in an asbestos uh, related setting? Or lastly, there's environmental exposure. Did you live near a mine? Did you live near a factory? Uh, did you live uh, 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 near a facility that was making use of asbestos? Because we know that it, from, from Cairo, Egypt, from London, from other places around the world, living, let's say within a kilometer, half a mile or so of uh, some of these facilities, people in the neighborhood will get uh, disease. Uh, so uh, history taking is important. Uh, and then we need to train up more radiologists and more pathologists to sharpen their skills to look for asbestos related uh, conditions uh, as well. And let me stop there. Thank you, Arthur. If I speak a little bit about the Sri Lankan experience, uh, it's it's the lack of awareness, I think, mainly because, uh, like how Priyanka said, we have a lot of contract workers, and they they work, you know, in multitude of uh, construction industries, or or they may go into ag agriculture at a certain period of time. So they change their work work, uh, you know, as as and when the requirements are available. So because of that, even when you ask for exposure history, they, they themselves may not realize that they have been exposed to. So that a lack of awareness and 80% of Sri Lankan roofing sheets are of asbestos, cement asbestos products. And even at the installation itself, I'm not talking about the product manufacturing companies, but even at installation, the use, they on the roof itself, they cut these, they saw these uh, asbestos roofing into size when they put it. So there itself, they may be exposing not only themselves, but like Arthur said, so many others around it. So sometimes history taking, uh, the doctors have to do it very diligently because it's, it's easy to miss because the exposure is great. And people in Sri Lanka haven't realized because it's still very widely used. Despite we went into, in 2018, we went into a ban and that was revoked. Uh, it's still widely used because I think people still don't understand the implications of exposure to their own health. So, so this is what uh, I have experienced and the latency because in Sri Lanka, we, we, we don't have so much of industrial hygiene. We have no government uh, trained uh, industrial hygienists in Sri Lanka. And we have very, very few occupational health physicians or, or community uh, med physicians in community medicine who, who is exposed to occupational health. So that may be another challenge that we face in Sri Lanka on, on diagnosis factors in asbestos or any occupational health related diseases for, for a matter of fact, not just asbestos. Yeah. Um, and, this, and this really just goes back to this manpower issue. And this is not a new concept. Merriweather and Price in 1930 said that uh, workers, and that implies others, should be given a sane appreciation of the risk. If you're dealing with hazardous materials, you ought to know that, and you can then help protect yourself as well. Priyanka, do you want to add anything else? Um, one more, another thing in India, like those factories, they are not using that word asbestos or anything. They call it um, fiber cement. So I asked 
that owner that what is it like why you are using fiber cement this is asbestos and he said no no madam this is asbestos i know but this is not toxic and this is not harmful because we because we are using it in a closed uh, container and they, we have this kind of vacuum uh, technology and and just you uh, like uh, if you enter the this factory you can see this okay there are things they are talking about but the behind that uh, that factory there is one place where the the like, old broken sheets are there everywhere one pulverizer is uh, there and they are crushing it without any pp and everything so this is kind of scenario you can see and people are very uh, like they are very assured that there is no harm related to asbestos fibers so this is kind of thing uh, yeah, I want, wanted to share. I'm sure we can go on chatting about, you know, problems that we, we encounter in this part of the world. And uh, very so similar have, with Sri Lanka also. Like, yes, so I guess I we found have to very similar. collectively work together to find some solutions to uplift, like how Arthur said, you know, uplift the uh, occupational health and hygiene in, in, in this part of the world. So uh, with regards to time, I think we are, we are up. So... Uh, Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Priyanka, for, for the information and for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Alec. Thanks very, very much. Uh, I think everyone on the webinar can see the tremendous value of sharing our experiences globally. I feel very privileged to be part of the, this conversation. And uh, as Asani says, there, we could have a whole webinar on this. I have a request for Arthur. Uh, we're going to move on now to the, our next presenter, but Arthur, there's a really interesting question in the chat from, I, I think it's Michael Gray, and the question is, uh, is there a synergistic effect with exposure to radon and radon progeny, uh, which is common in some residential settings, by the way, also in occupational settings? Could you answer that in the chat? I think it would apply mostly to lung cancer, but there may be other things you're sure. aware of that I'm not. And then everyone monitor the chat. Arthur will provide. Uh, I, I can give the answer very quickly. Uh, there's a there's a synergistic effect between smoking and radon. There's no data between radon and asbestos that I have ever seen. Wow, that's very interesting. I would have thought that there would have been somewhere. No, Maybe nobody's ever thought. nobody's ever studied that. Okay, well, let's put that in the. If Mark or Paul know something about it, if there's something breaking or something going on that we don't know about, we'll have a chance to uh, put that on the table. Uh, radon exposure is a big, big issue in Canada and in some other countries. 15% of all our lung cancer in Canada comes from radon exposure, second only to smoking. So I'm going to move on now. And uh, as you'll see, we've, we've tried to frame this session so that you start with the medical impact and then we, we focus in on mesothelioma, which is, of course, the marker cancer from asbestos exposure. And then we'll sort of zoom out again to the epidemiological aspects. So I'm very, very pleased to be introducing um, my friend and uh, now I guess I'll say longtime colleague, uh, Dr. Mark de Perot. Uh, Mark's originally from Belgium, but he's been in Canada for quite a long time now. And uh, I've worked with him both through Workplace Health Without Borders and also through um, uh, another board I'm on, which is the Canadian Mesothelioma Foundation. Mark's a thoracic surgeon. He's a, a gifted surgeon and uh, capable of operating at the highest possible level. He's at our Princess Margaret Cancer Center and Toronto General Hospital, which is part of our university health network here in Toronto. He's a professor of surgery and immunology at the University of Toronto. He's also the director of the Mesothelioma Program at the uh, University Health Network and the Thoracic Oncology Site Lead at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. So he's, he's right at the heart of um, uh, diagnosis and treatment of mesothelioma in Canada. It's our, our most active center. That program is the largest program in Canada. It provides multidisciplinary care to mesothelioma patients from across the country. Mark's also senior scientist at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute. There his focus is on the integration of immunotherapy and multimodality therapy for mesothelioma 
with a specific focus on the impact of hypofractionated radiation on the immune system. And he's doing leading edge work in the world on this. His work led to the development of an innovative concept using a short course of, of uh, subablative hypofractionated uh, hemothoracic radiation before surgery in mesothelioma. He calls it the SMART approach, S-M-A-R-T. He'll probably explain that, what that means. And this approach also provides an ideal platform for immunotherapy and mesothelioma. So what we've asked Mark to do is to give you a snapshot. Obviously, again, this is an overview. It's, it's, it's not getting into some of the granular detail that uh, could easily be the subject of a, a whole session. In fact, it is the subject of a conference next week in uh, Lille, France, that I'm, uh, Mark, I think, is going to, uh, the International Mesothelioma Interest Group. But it's just to give everyone on the call some hope that finally medical science is getting at this uh, terrible, uh, usually fatal cancer, and that there is there is some light uh, in the situation. So, Mark, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Alec. Uh, thank you very much for the, the kind invitation on, on the kind of introduction as well. And, and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, on share our experience with all of you. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, yes. OK, great, yeah. Yeah, so the um, so so Alec asked me to to speak a little bit more about early detection and also about treatment or or on our approach with uh, which has included um, new opportunity for radiation that I will present. Uh, so uh, as a, uh, an introduction, I'll just give you a little bit of a, an overview of our activity at uh, Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center in Toronto uh, in in the field of. Uh, asbestos and mesothelioma. So we started working in in um, in uh, you know in, in the clinic to look at a patient with mesothelioma probably about 15, 20 years ago. And we started a screening program back in 2005, which included a, a low dose CT. And I'll present a little bit of our experience with that. Uh, uh, we also have a, a laboratory where we do translational research, and, and we have a number of preclinical models to look at different type of treatment on, on the uh, mutation in mesothelioma and the interaction with the, uh, the effect of the treatment. Uh, and then we have a multidisciplinary clinic at Princess Margaret, which with a goal to really provide um, an opportunity for early referral in order to get the diagnosis. We do see a lot of delay between the you know, the initial presentation of symptoms on eventual, eventually the referral on the, the treatment approach. So the goal is really to shorten that, that time to have a patient being referred early in the process where the symptom starts, uh, facilitate also the staging on the therapy, and uh, um, importantly, uh, having expert uh, opinions in terms of uh, pathology and radiology, uh, as uh, Dr. Drexler you know, mentioned before. And, uh, we are a referring center for, for Canada. So we do see 60 to 80 patients with mesothelioma a year in our practice. Uh, this is really the acknowledgement of, of everyone in our program. So it is a large program with a lot of individuals really focusing on, on asbestos and mesothelioma here across all, all disciplines, uh, um, including the laboratory. And we do have uh, a lot of collaboration across, uh, across UHN on the University of Toronto, and we also collaborate uh, uh, quite a bit with the group in, uh, in Zurich in Switzerland. So our screening uh, program was initiated back in 2005 uh, uh, following the uh, experience with screening for lung cancer. And since a lot of uh, individual exposed to asbestos are also smokers, uh, we took it uh, and expanded the screening program from uh, smoking uh, individuals to asbestos exposed individuals. That uh, program has been ongoing up until the, the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. And we had about 1,500 individuals who uh, were screened every year or every other year in the program. Uh, the mean age was uh, about 61 years old. And a lot of the participants were smokers. Uh, uh, and we also collected blood at the time of the um, uh, CT scan. 
since 2020, um, screening program have become part of standard of care in Ontario, and, and uh, eventually we switch to use CT scan more of a standard of care for detecting uh, lung cancer, particularly, and, and also uh, occasionally uh, mesothelioma. But what we've realized is that CT scan is probably not the best way to screen individuals for mesothelioma. The, the CT scan will pick up uh, occasional early disease, but very often patients will develop mesothelioma in between their scan. Um, so the CT scan is not that efficient and also not practical in order to expand the use of the CT scan across uh, um, you know, multiple individuals. But this is uh, our experience over 15 years of screening with CT scan. And you can see that we found 19 patients with lung cancer on 20 patients with uh, mesothelioma. Six of them were peritoneal and 14 were uh, pleural uh, mesothelioma. But because of the lack of practicality to use CT scan, we increasingly switch our focus to look at, at blood on, on liquid biopsy in general to potentially uh, screen more efficiently. Here. And also in our clinic, about half of the uh, patients with mesothelioma don't have a clear exposure to asbestos. So asbestos exposure may not be, uh, uh, or may not be uh, sufficient in order to detect meso mesothelioma in our, in our population. So we really looked at, at you know, blood sample in order to, to potentially have a better screening uh, capacity. So these are some of the uh, markers that have been used uh, in mesothelioma and have been used uh, or looked at in terms of screening. None of them so far ha has been standing out as being useful for screening. Uh, they often go up quite late in the process when the disease is already potentially even symptomatic, but mesothelin has probably been the one that has been the most uh, uh, looked at because it's quite specific for, for mesothelioma particularly here. Yeah. Um, so we've done some work in, with the group in Zurich uh, injecting uh, uh, asbestos in, in, uh, in mice, and then we monitored them uh, for 33 weeks. Uh, um, and we were uh, interested to see what was the effect of asbestos on the immune system, as well as the, as well as the genetic uh, dysregulation that the asbestos will create. And one of the findings we had is that asbestos exposure in, in the peritoneum, at least, is associated with a progressive rise in, in macrophage, which are uh, inflammatory uh, cells that will uh, react to the inflammation related to the asbestos. And what we've seen is that the uh, uh, mesothelial progenitor cells, these are kind of the stem cell for the, the, the pleural and mesothelial uh, surface, um, are increasing in parallel. So it seems that there is an interplay between the mesothelial progenitor cells or mesothelial stem cell on the macrophage that will progressively increase with time, and particularly when the, the mesothelioma uh, occurs in, uh, in our mice. So we took that uh, to, to the next step in order to try to tease it out in, in the blood. And, and that was done in collaboration with uh, Shana Kelly, who has developed in Toronto a, a new uh, screening uh, capacity looking at nanoparticle magnetic ranking. So basically, uh, she can isolate a few cells within uh, one or two ml of blood, uh, which is quite uh, unique. So we looked at uh, these mesothelial precursor cells in the blood, uh, and we uh, initially looked at it in the mice, and then we looked at it in our patients on in individuals you know, exposed to asbestos as part of our screening uh, program. And, and basically, we were looking at these uh, mesothelial precursor cell or, or you know, mesothelial stem cell uh, that have very specific characteristics. They express mesothelin on their surface, so quite specific. And then CD34, CD90 are just two markers for, for stem cell uh, uh, capacity here. And what we've seen is that these uh, uh, mesothelial uh, stem cell progressively increase with time. Uh, and as the tumor progress uh, with mesothelioma, the rate is higher, but we've also seen that uh, uh, these uh, cells are already upregulated uh, during the asbestos, after the asbestos exposure on, on one of the stem cells, particularly with the CD90, uh, uh, was upregulated quite early in the, in the process. So it does open the door for possibly using this uh, mesothelial stem cell as a, as a marker potentially of uh, mesothelial injury uh, in relation to asbestos or maybe a marker uh, to, to uh, detect patients at higher risk of developing mesothelioma here. 
No, the other part uh, that we are looking at uh, uh, is also what are the mutation in these uh, uh, stem cell or that that work that is in in progress currently. You know, in terms of uh, mutation in mesothelioma, there has been a lot of progress over the past uh, decade to really identify the type of mutation that will uh, be associated with uh, uh, mesothelioma. Here. On one of the key genes that, that uh, a lot of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard of is, is BAP1, which is present in at least 60% of the patients with mesothelioma. And uh, when BAP1 is mutated, basically the function of the BAP1 is lost. Some of the other genes are NF2, uh, and uh, another one is uh, uh, P16 or, or CDK2A, which is a complete loss of that part of the chromosome very, very frequently here. Yeah. Now there are works in mice that have shown that uh, the more mutation you get, the more likely you're going to have uh, meso that the mice are going to have mesothelioma, here, or the faster the mesothelioma is going to progress. So if you have BAP1 uh, uh, mutation, you have some risk, and then if you combine BAP1 and F NF2 mutation, the risk increase, and then if you have three mutations, then you get a, a much higher risk, and you can see the survival of the mice decrease with the number of mutations. So these mutations do matter. Uh, um, in the development of uh, uh, mesothelioma here. Now, this has uh, led to uh, a number of uh, uh, important work on, on the clinical side, looking at BAP1 loss. And what we've realized is that when the pleural uh, surface or peritoneal surface loses the BAP1 function, so you have BAP1 loss, the gene is not expressed anymore in the nucleus of the cell, these mutations are present before the mesothelioma uh, starts. So we've realized that you can, uh, when you do a biopsy of the pleura here, you can see the mutation present, but you may not have yet uh, uh, evidence of mesothelioma. And the mesothelioma typically on the pathology side, it's demonstrated by an invasion of the cell into the surrounding structure. So you see the cell invading into the fat, into the muscle or into the lung, yeah. but the BAP1 loss can be present before you have that invasion. And what we've seen is that, that uh, uh, these mutations can be present a few years before the, the true diagnosis of mesothelioma. And if you look at patients with mesothelioma who have a component of what we call mesothelioma in situ, so it's a proliferation of the mesothelial cell without invasion, the prognosis is better. So, so there is a transition phase uh, between the asbestos exposure, the development of the, the mutation, which will lead to proliferation of the mesothelial cell on mesothelioma in situ, and eventually on invasive mesothelioma. On, on that process, does take a few years, which opens the door to intervene a lot earlier than we were able to do before. So this is a, 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 a picture of a mesothelioma in situ, and, and this is a, a surgical picture. So uh, I'm sorry, hopefully it doesn't, uh, um, Great problem to anyone, but it's just to show this is the DR5, so the muscle between the lung and on the stomach on the left side. And you can see these white uh, patches, and you can see a few on uh, along the ribs as well. On, on these white patches are uh, what we call carcinoma uh, or mesothelioma in situ. So the, the mesothelial cells are proliferating, but they are not invading into the, the structure surrounding them. And, uh, uh, on pathology, you can see that. You can see that proliferation of mesothelial cell. On the BAP1 is lost in this cell, so you can see it doesn't have any uh, staining uh, uh, coloration. So the blue is the normal coloration. While another mutation, MTAP, which re reflects also P16 or CDKN2A, this one is preserved. So you can see the, the brown staining. So, so BAP1 loss leads to that cellular proliferation, which will put patients at risk of uh, uh, mesothelioma within a few years. So this is a, uh, an example of one of our patients from the screening program, uh, which uh, uh, highlights the, the process. So that's a, uh, this is a patient who, uh, in, back in 2008, started to have uh, intermittent pleural effusion. And then in 2013, uh, there was some abnormality on the lining of, of the pleura. So we did some biopsy, which demonstrated no invasion. So at the time, it was deemed that the patient did not have mesothelioma, and he was continued to, to be monitored uh, with low dose CT scan. And then in 2020, he started to have some uh, uh, pain along the ribs and on, on develop a new nodularity along the pleura. So we went back to the biopsy that was done in 2013 and look at the mutation, which at the time were, were not known. And what we found out is that the BAP1 was already lost at the, in 2013. Uh, there was no invasion. So mesothelioma, um, invasive mesothelioma again was confirmed not to be present. 
But in 2020, we did some new uh, biopsy on, on, then we could see the invasion of the mesothelioma here on the PET scan also uh, uh, has uh, been uh, positive. So that patient eventually was treated for his invasive mesothelioma, turned out to be epithelary with a T3 N0. Uh, uh, and uh, that really provided uh, uh, the opportunity for early intervention when the mesothelioma was starting to be invasive. But as we understand and uh, um, uh, better the progression of this abnormality, we may be able to intervene before the meso invasive mesothelioma uh, uh, shows up. And that patient was treated not three years ago and is doing well with no recurrence. Now, the other part is the, the um, the fact that BAP1 uh, mutation can be present in families. This is relatively rare, but it is uh, um, uh, regular uh, to see patients with um, mesothelioma in the context of uh, familial BAP1 deletion. And, and this is a, a work from the group in Chicago looking at their patients coming through a clinic. Uh, uh, looking at familial uh, mutation on predisposition for mesothelioma. And you can see that a number of these uh, patients with mesothelioma had BAP1 uh, loss, but there are also a number of uh, uh, other mutations uh, that were familial, so present in the blood, not only in the tumor, uh, that were pre predisposing these uh, patients to mesothelioma. So, so there may be uh, a genetic mutation that may predispose to mesothelioma in the context of asbestos exposure. So the BAP1 loss, uh, by itself is not sufficient to create the, the risk of mesothelioma, but uh, in association with asbestos exposure, it can uh, uh, create a significant risk for these uh, uh, family members. And uh, when should uh, familial uh, mutation be suspected? It's predominantly in uh, patients with uh, epithelioid mesothelioma, uh, more frequent in peritoneal than pleural mesothelioma, when there is no asbestos exposure in younger patients and also patients who had uh, uh, other uh, cancer diagnosis. So patients coming with multiple cancer, including mesothelioma, uh, uh, should be suspected for familial uh, mutation. And BAP1 mutation does predispose to uveal melanoma, uh, skin melanoma, uh, and renal cell carcinoma, as well as some other cancer um, uh, less frequently. So it does uh, shows uh, a risk in other type of uh, cancer than mesothelioma. Now on the treatment side, one of the major breakthroughs over the past uh, few years has been the uh, uh, development of immunotherapy. So the immunotherapy is targeting the immune system to help the body to fight the tumor more efficiently. Uh, and uh, this study uh, published uh, uh, two years ago uh, demonstrated that immunotherapy uh, provided a significant benefit in terms of survival for patients with mesothelioma, uh, with a median survival going from 14 months to 18 months. So it's still uh, far away from what we want to achieve, but a major breakthrough in terms of uh, um, possibility of uh, treatment. And what we've seen as well is that the immunotherapy was more efficient in the non-epithelioid mesothelioma than the epithelioid mesothelioma, where the effect is relatively similar to chemotherapy, although immunotherapy has a much longer effect uh, on the, as we uh, see patients uh, stopping their treatment and being monitored, we do see that the effect is really uh, uh, continuing uh, to have an impact uh, while chemotherapy does not. So immunotherapy is a very beneficial treatment for both uh, type of mesothelioma here. Now, taking the, uh, the uh, um, treatment option of radiation, which we've had a lot of experience in our program uh, with, uh, we went into the, the laboratory and tried to understand how does the uh, radiation work. The radiation does have a lot of limitations in terms of uh, uh, toxicity. When you use it at a high dose, it can be toxic on the lung, particularly toxic on the heart or the spine. So you cannot use high dose radiation uh, uh, in the chest uh, for mesothelioma because of the uh, uh, surrounding uh, structure. But what we've seen, and I'll present some of our clinical work as well after that, uh, is that a lower dose of radiation, which is uh, a very uh, uh, safe, uh, may have an effect on the immune system. And these are mice that we injected with mesothelioma. We treated with a short course of radiation, so three doses of radiation of five gray, uh, uh, mice tolerated that very well. Um, and then we did the surgery a week later uh, uh, to allow the immune system to uh, be activated from the radiation. 
and then uh, the, the mice were cured with the, the surgery. And then we were challenged the mice uh, on the other side with the same uh, type of mesotheliomatia. And we've seen that uh, in about 38% uh, of the mice, the mesothelioma did not grow. And in those mice where the mesothelioma grew, the, the growth rate was a lot slower. And, and then we challenged the mice in the pleural cavity. Here, and we've seen that these mice did not grow mesothelioma in the pleural cavity. Well, if they were not treated with radiation uh, on surgery, uh, these mice, all of them developed a very uh, rapid progression of mesothelioma. And what we've seen is that, that those of radiation uh, create a vaccination. So the, the, the body or the immune system react against the, the, the tumor, and then it keeps the, the uh, reaction in memory. And when you show the mice um, immune system on other uh, um, mesothelioma um, uh, cell line, they will uh, reject the cell line as part of their immune response. So very similar to what you will see in a viral infection. So you kind of vaccinate the mice and then the, the, the vaccination kind of prevents the progression of the tumor by activating the immune system. And then what we've seen is that you can combine that uh, uh, short course of radiation of, of three uh, low dose uh, uh, with some immunotherapy effect. And you can see that these effects are synergistic and can even lead to a cure in some of the mice. So very potent effect uh, uh, synergistically together uh, uh, with uh, the advantage to have a low dose of radiation. So this has been our, our clinical experience. So, so the radiation initially, when we started to use it before surgery to have more effect, we use five times uh, uh, or five doses of radiation of five gray. And then we remove the tumor on the lung um, one week later, and then we monitored our patient, uh, about 10% uh, of them uh, went on to have some chemotherapy as part of their treatment. But the combination of the two was, uh, was quite efficient. Uh, the role to remove the lung was because five times uh, or five uh, dose of radiation was too high uh, in order to be able to preserve the lung. And, and part of our current uh, development is to decrease that dose to preserve the lung uh, uh, that I will show you. So this has been our initial experience with the, the radiation followed by the surgery. So we've treated over 100 patients. The initial results uh, were quite safe. Uh, and then what we've seen is that patients who had an immune effect actually develop uh, some benefit in the long term. And a number of these patients survive beyond uh, five years. And, and some of them uh, have come to about 10 years a follow-up uh, after their treatment with radiation on, um, on surgery here. What we are seeing as well is that the number of mutations have an impact on the effect of the radiation on the immune system. On the, the patients who have lost the P16 or CDKN2A, the immune effect is decreased or absent on, on they lose the benefit of the radiation. So the long-term benefit is driven by the uh, immune response. And you can see that Patients, uh, uh, some of the patients were alive at five years uh, without recurrence of their uh, tumor, which is uh, certainly very encouraging for us. So five doses of radiation was toxic on the lung. So when we've seen these results, we decided to uh, decrease the dose of radiation and we've seen in the mice that three uh, doses were sufficient. So we did a, a, a short study to uh, identify whether three doses were safe on the lung uh, and be able to preserve the lung. So we gave three doses of radiation, then we did a surgery preserving the lung in most of the patients, and then we looked at more immune characteristic. Yeah. That study uh, was recently finished, and what we've seen is that the effect in the long term is also quite encouraging, uh, even though we can preserve the lung, on, on the lung is, is safely uh, uh, preserved despite the radiation. And what we've seen is that the radiation does increase some of the key marker uh, of uh, vaccination, uh, what we call L15, LFT, FLT3 uh, Lagand on, on IP10 or CXCL10 uh, is uh, typically associated with vac vaccination effect. If you look at the uh, um, uh, COVID vaccine, these uh, uh, markers are also upregulated with the COVID vaccine. So, so this is quite characteristic of an immune response uh, with vaccination. Oh, now what we are doing is to uh, identify the type of immune cells that are responding to, to the radiation with the idea to identify what is the tumor uh, uh, generating to allow the immune system to be recognized. And so we looked at the T cell and we can look at what is the, the characteristic of the T cell that we allow recognition of the marker 
of the antigen that we call, uh, that will uh, help the immune system to react against that, uh, that tumor. And the idea behind that is that if you can identify the, the marker of the tumor that will generate the immune response, you can potentially uh, uh, expand that, that response either with uh, immunotherapy, but also uh, making off the shelf cells that will directly target that antigen. So developing some uh, very uh, personalized therapy against uh, uh, mesothelioma with the idea that potentially we could start using these uh, therapies if they're well tolerated in patients with mesothelioma in situ before they develop invasive mesothelioma. So basically vaccinate them before having the tumor become uh, an invasive mesothelioma uh, with a, a rapid progression. And finally, this is my last slide, is where we are in terms of treatments. Uh, so we use that short course of radiation with uh, three doses, uh, which allows us to preserve the lung. Then we do the surgery. And then we've added the possibility to have immunotherapy once patients recovered from the, uh, the surgery in order to perpetuate the effect of the uh, uh, radiation with the idea that if you can amplify that response, you potentially can uh, achieve a cure in these patients. On, during that window between radiation and surgery of one week, we use a low-dose sacrophosphamide, uh, which is a, a, a very uh, um, almost placebo type of dosage of chemotherapy in the form of pill, which may help the immune system to be uh, uh, more efficient at will, at, as it is uh, being activated from the radiation. So half of the patients get the pill, on the other half does not. So in, in conclusion, the, uh, the screening for mesothelioma with liquid biopsy on, on particularly blood uh, uh, is in progress on, on the detection of the circulating mesothelial precursor cells could potentially monitor the pleural damage from the asbestos exposure on, on identify in the individuals who will need to be screened more closely here. Uh, BAP1 loss demonstrates early change with evidence of mesothelioma in situ, and that provides an opportunity for early intervention, potentially before the tumor becomes invasive, so a treatment that will be more efficient. Uh, uh, Subablative radiation followed by surgery is a new treatment approach, uh, uh, which generates an in situ vaccination, which offers new opportunities uh, of treatment in combination with immunotherapy. And then future studies uh, uh, will be important to determine the tumor antigen, uh, which could open the door for developing a vaccine on, on more personalized therapy for uh, mesothelioma here. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, as I mentioned, a number of individuals in, in our group, but also the close collaboration we've had with the Canadian Mesothelioma Foundation uh, and uh, uh, with Edith uh, Goldberg, Alec, on, on many others who have been very uh, uh, true partner in our ability to uh, um, um, make uh, progress in the treatment of mesothelioma and allow us to do these different type of uh, uh, studies. And also, this is part of our team, and, and this is uh, Dr. Cho, who is the radiation oncologist in our, in our team, and on the uh, individuals from our uh, research uh, team. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, I think everyone can see, and it's people around the world, can see the tremendous potential of medical science, although it's a shame that we have to deal with a preventable cancer like mesothelioma. We have brilliant, dedicated people. I can testify that Mark's team is incredibly impressive. And of course, one of our objectives for Workplace Health Without Borders is to make this kind of expertise available all around the world. And that's a huge challenge because of resourcing issues. So Mark, there are a couple of questions that came up in the chat, mm -hmm. which um, if you haven't seen them, uh, there's, there's one which is uh, simply asking what a liquid biopsy is. Mm -hmm. And then a second question, which is talking about lung transplants. And I think if you could possibly, um, in the next couple of minutes, if you have time, respond in the chat to those questions, mm -hmm. because uh, due to time pressure, I really want to move on to uh, Paul Demare's presentation. Uh, but people can mount, monitor the chat uh, for a response on those two issues. I think they're pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we'll turn to the, the next presentation. And the <clears throat> we're hoping to gain a little bit of time with Paul, uh, uh, so that we have a good time left for the, the panel. So I want to introduce Paul, and then he'll get on with his, uh, his presentation. Uh, I feel really privileged to have Paul Demare with us today. He's the director of the Occupational Cancer Research Center here in Toronto. 
He's also a professor with the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He's a clinical professor with the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia in Western Canada. He's also the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre on Occupational and Environmental Cancer. So you're dealing with someone who's active on a global uh, level. Paul has a PhD in epidemiology, a master's degree in occupational hygiene, and his research focuses primarily on occupational cancer, and he's been a member of many national and international committees and expert panels dealing with asbestos. And Paul's going to be giving us an overview of just where we stand, uh, epidemiologically speaking. And there has been a question uh, about ingested asbestos. It's come up from Julian Branch in the chat. We may be in a situation where Paul will respond to that through the chat uh, because uh, time is a bit pressured and he's got a, a lot to cover. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, Alec. I'm going to speak uh, quickly and sorry for the continued delay a bit. Um, so uh, you've already heard what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I think you heard a lot from uh, from Arthur going uh, initially about uh, asbestos related diseases, that there's a broad variety of them. Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so and hope hopefully to uh, bring ourselves back into time is about how we measure the uh, impact of asbestos on a kind of a country level. Um, so uh, we also call this the burden of, uh, measure the burden of uh, asbestos related disease. Um, so you've heard a lot about the different diseases associated. Um, a term that you'll often see when we're looking at the impact of asbestos is disability adjusted life years. Uh, so it's trying to look beyond just the number of uh, people who died or developed disease, but um, how many years of, uh, of good life are lost uh, due to asbestos. Some issues that I would also mention is, uh, you know, the issue of whether we're looking at deaths or new cases of diseases. We get different numbers if that's uh, the case. And uh, the challenges of measuring the economic burden. But you're going to hear more about economic burden when Emilio Tampa uh, speaks at one of the subsequent seminars, so I won't speak a lot about that. This is from the WHO ILO um, uh, project to estimate uh, the impact of asbestos in 183 countries. Um, and you just see the numbers over time that have been estimated, and you see lung cancer, ovarian cancer, laryngeal cancer, and mesothelioma. Uh, so this is part of an international project. Uh, and when you hear about the number of cancers caused, they uh, come from these kind of projects, from this and the global burden of, uh, of cancer. I put this up here to show also that uh, these numbers are increasing, uh, but you need to know also that uh, these numbers our estimates. We don't always know exactly how many, uh, you know, in most countries you can't really assign, you know, whose uh, lung cancer, for instance, was due to asbestos versus not. Uh, we're usually looking at the risk among people exposed to asbestos and then estimating from that. Um, even mesotheliomas, which are very specific to asbestos, uh, for the most part, or similar types of fibers, are very difficult to count. So I'll get into a few of those issues. I also wanted to mention that we're here just looking at these four cancers because this is a conservative process uh, that goes on here. There's a lot of evidence that's uh, needed for these things and it's uh, so you don't see the digestive cancers there or other cancers uh, that uh, are thought to be associated with asbestos. You really are seeing the four that have been classified by IARC and therefore have a lot of evidence to support uh, their estimation of this. But you see these numbers increasing over time. Here I'm just putting side by side the WHO ILO estimates with the Global Burden of Disease Project. Uh, the Global Burden of Disease Project is a giant project that tries to look at a wide variety of different, uh, different causes of cancer. Uh, and uh, but does at least include asbestos and some other occupational exposures in that. Uh, you can see that their numbers are a bit higher, um, 
but also that they also uh, include asbestosis uh, because it's beyond just looking at cancer. But that the numbers there are pretty small, uh, you know, overall. In terms of estimating, these are not particularly far apart because these are done from kind of large statistical models. They're still ending up with, uh, you know, over 200,000 uh, uh, cancers due to, um, uh, due to asbestos exposure globally. Uh, but I'm also putting here that it makes a difference, uh, you know, how you count these things, uh, but also that we're seeing changes over time also within the global burden of disease where their numbers are also going up. Uh, but it's an inter interesting thing here that you see the 239,000 is the combination of asbestosis and those four cancers uh, from the Global Burden of Disease Project. And you see that the numbers are going up in both men and women, uh, but they're going up higher in, in women than they are in men. Um, and then you see the death rates, and the death rates are actually uh, going down because our population is rising quickly in the world. Uh, so um, those rates are going down, but again, those rates are going down uh, much less in women than in men. And then last, you see this thing of uh, DALI's, the uh, disability adjusted, uh, you know, years lost in people's lives. Um, and those continue to go up and those track on the number of cases. So again, measuring in different ways uh, how things are going. And I'll talk about a bit about what we might be seeing, why we're seeing some, uh, uh, some gender differences over time. Here's the map that is from that Global Burden of Disease Project. And where you see the high rates of asbestos-related disease are these like darker red colors. Uh, and you'll see that they're primarily uh, pointing to those in um, the higher income countries for the most part, not only, uh, but often in the higher income countries or in places that have uh, had substantial asbestos mining and therefore, let's say, tracked things like mesothelioma. And you see much lower rates in uh, other parts of the world. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you that this is one thing that we should be skeptical about. Uh, and I'll talk about why that's the case over the next few minutes. Uh, the rates of uh, mesothelioma, in fact, uh, even though uh, countries like uh, uh, the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden banned asbestos quite some time ago. It really is only since about 2000 that we've begun. So the last 20 years, uh, not very long, uh, that we finally have seen those rates begin to go down. But that was accompanied not only by the banning of asbestos, but a lot stricter regulation of exposure for asbestos. And even then, we don't see it particularly, you know, or absolutely consistent. So you see that uh, Denmark is not as clear. They have leveled off in their number of mesothelioma cases, but have not dropped down so much. And on the right, you see the rates for women. And there you see them uh, actually rising in uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, um, and maybe arriving at about the same similar rates. Uh, uh, in uh, Denmark, uh, where they've actually leveled off there for women. These, I will point out that these are incidence rates, uh, that in the Nordic countries, uh, we don't just, you know, count deaths. We're able to count the number of new cases. Uh, and that gives us, I think, a better way to uh, get uh, a bigger picture of what the uh, rates are. I'm just going to throw up... Uh, a, uh, a slide here to show that even in Canada now, we're seeing a leveling of rates um, for uh, mesothelioma, a dropping among men, maybe. This is just Ontario, but it's pretty representative of Canada outside of Quebec. Quebec's hard to, to generate things with. Um, you see that in Ontario, in Canada overall, we had in the mid 1970s or so, we had a peak of asbestos exposure. Uh, so, or asbestos usage here in Canada. 
uh, and we're finally seeing the um, uh, the impact of that now. Canada just banned a few years ago, so this isn't an effect of banning. This is an effect of controlling exposure. Um, and unfortunately, even once we ban uh, asbestos, we have to continue to do that. But you also see here that the rates among women are increasing still uh, here, which is a phenomenon seen in a lot of different countries. There are challenges of estimating the impact in middle and low-income countries uh, for two different reasons in these global projects, which is one reason I'm a bit skeptical about their rates. One is that these models uh, rely upon both uh, accurate information on exposure um, or and uh, accurate information on asbestos-related disease, both of which can be challenging to find in um, uh, in many countries of the world. Particularly, we have a lack of accurate exposure information. How many people are exposed, uh, the levels of exposure. And this is why we have to really do these kind of large modeling projects. Um, a lot of the modeling projects also are based upon uh, mesothelioma. Uh, they're, they're extrapolated from what the rates of mesothelioma are in countries uh, which is thought to be an indicator of how much uh, asbestos may have been used, which might be accurate if we were actually counting mesotheliomas correctly. This just shows you some work that was done uh, looking at, um, to show you how we actually determine how many mesotheliomas in the world are. There are, you know, we rely a lot upon uh, mesotheliomas and cancers overall that are reported to the World Health Organization that tries to compile the worldwide statistics. But look at the proportion of mesotheliomas that we're estimating are out there by high uh, upper middle and lower middle and lower uh, income countries, which are that last column. And you can see that there are hardly any uh, coming being reported to the WHO from the lower uh, middle and lower income countries, that's a combined category, uh, or from even the upper middle income countries, it's relatively small proportion of what we think is out there. But I say we think because we don't really have, uh, uh, this is all going to be based upon some estimates. And these are people doing the best that they can to estimate. But this is why we have to be a little bit skeptical that the burden may be quite a bit higher. The other thing to look at is that um, you see here the, the trends over time in the use of asbestos, which is a good predictor of eventual asbestos-related disease. So it peaked back there in the 70s for the high-income countries. It was already starting to be used quite a bit, and it's continued in uh, the what we call the upper middle-income countries. Uh, and then in the lower-income countries, it was relatively low at first but has increased over time. Um, so that burden that we're seeing, all those really red countries where they had the higher rates, those were the higher income countries. We're going to see those rates later on in a number of different countries. And so the predictions that we're going down in mesothelioma, I think are really premature globally because of that. And there's a real correlation that we see when we look at the countries that track both disease and exposure, or at least use of asbestos, we see this kind of correlation between uh, malignant mesothelioma death rates and the amount of asbestos uh, that's been consumed in those countries. Um, in the bottom here, I'm sorry, this is probably small for people to see. You'll see that you know China, Russia, India, Brazil are, are kind of not part of this model. And that's because uh, we don't believe that they actually have the mesothelioma uh, rates to be able to accurately do this kind of an exercise. Um, unless we're counting the mesothelioma as well, we're not going to see that. Now we've been, you know, I uh, say we, the, the WHO and the ILO has been recommending since 2007 that uh, countries in order to begin to prevent asbestos exposure, collect more accurate data uh, on, on how people are exposed as well as the impact of disease. And having country-specific data is very important for prevention. 
And I encourage people to take a look at this. This was done back in 2007, this uh, outline for the development of national programs to eliminate asbestos-related disease, but it remains quite relevant. Uh, and I won't talk again about the um, uh, economic burden, but one thing that helped us in Canada push forward the ban was looking at the economic burden. So we did a project in Canada where we tried to estimate, and again, you see those four cancers uh, here, how many cancers per year are due to asbestos uh, in Canada uh, over uh, over 2,400, close to 2,500 cancers per year, just from these four. Uh, that's not counting uh, others that might be due to digestive cancers or to, um, as well to uh, respiratory disease that's not cancer. And that amounted to $2.4 billion Canadian per year in, in cost. And what happened in terms of working towards the ban is that uh, the groups that kind of led the work on the ban were able to use those numbers. And those numbers actually ended up being part of the justification for the ban on asbestos in Canada. So you see our, our numbers of cases here quoted. Um, and you see here also uh, the amount, our economic estimates were used as well. So that kind of statistical data, it might seem as though uh, we don't need it for those of us who believe that asbestos is an important you know, thing to prevent, uh, but the fact is it does help us carry the day. And I thought I would put this here just to say that even though, um, even in Canada where we think we're uh, counting disease, uh, this is uh, some work we're doing. We're monitoring people who are in our asbestos worker registry in the province of Ontario and Canada. Um, it's just about, this is about 20,000 folks. And they have, uh, the construction workers in this data set have 10 times the risk of mesothelioma and 18 times the risk of, uh, of asbestosis. But you look at other pulmonary fibrosis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and they also have very, very high risks. Uh, so I don't think we're capturing all of uh, asbestosis or asbestos-related lung disease very accurately, even in a high-income country like Canada, uh, where we're able to link to hospital records. And this is based upon hospital records and all the health electronic health records. Um, in manufacturing, you can see that um, the manufacturing people that were in that registry, they have six times the risk of asbestosis, um, but they have 17 and a half times the risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And that's probably because uh, they're not uh, construction workers and it's probably not being uh, captured. They're not being accurately diagnosed. So I'm trying to get it back into time, although I'm still not quite there. Uh, I'm just going to summarize by saying uh, asbestos really does remain the leading workplace cause of death and chronic disease uh, globally based upon these global projects done by both the World Health Organization and the ILO, as well as the Global Dis Burden of Disease projects. Those projects play an important role in keeping this a high priority area uh, in, across the world. Uh, and so the, I think those projects are very important, but we also need to kind of recognize that those are just estimates um, and need to understand the limitations of those, especially when you apply them at the national level. And this is why we do need to do a better job at the national level in estimating the impact of disease. And that means more accurately diagnosing the disease and understanding exposure. And you've heard already uh, a number of the speakers early on in this thing talked about the importance of, uh, of uh, diagnosing these things. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and turn it back over to Alec and hopefully not have had us too far behind time. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I think everyone's going to be uh, uh, thinking a lot about your presentation. By the way, we're going to be distributing uh, the presentations from today, making them available on our website. and. As everyone can see, the application of really good uh, scientific thinking 
has been vital to advancing the cause of prevention of exposure to asbestos and ultimately substitution and elimination. Workplace Health Without Borders really wants to work from that strong scientific foundation. Paul's contributed tremendously to that. So thank you very much, Paul. And I'm double. So we're very privileged to have a closing panel and hopefully enough time for some discussion afterwards. And so I'll ask each of the panel members, do your best to stick within the sort of four to five minute uh, time frame. And what we wanted to do was to pick several parts of the world and give you a snapshot of where we are at with asbestos in those parts of the world. And it's often not a very good place. So Priyanka will be returning for this panel. I think Priyanka will have you last so that we'll, the, the others that we haven't heard from so far, they'll go first. So we have uh, Priyanka, we have Gabriel Mizan from South Africa, and we have Dr. Trung from Vietnam. So three parts of the world where this is a vivid, important current issue. So let's start with uh, Ga uh, Gabriel. And um, I think you've got a presentation. I think you're a co-host. I hope that's been arranged. And uh, we'll get yes. going. And what I'll do first is I'll give a very brief um, uh, uh, introduction, I guess, uh, to, to both of them. And because I wasn't ready to step in, I don't have the bios. So let's let Gabriel get started. And then I'll give, give the bios in a second uh, when I retrieve them from my system. So Gabriel? Okay, so uh, good day, uh, everyone. I gather good day is probably the safest greeting here with people here from all over the world. Uh, so I really um, prepared a very, very brief uh, presentation uh, just uh, about uh, South Africa, the legacy of asbestos in South Africa. And South Africa really played a very important role um, in the asbestos uh, production and uh, mining um, globally. So um, asbestos, um, we, we find the three different types of asbestos in South Africa. In fact, it's the only country where all three types of asbestos were uh, mined. And I'm not sure if I can be very proud of that, but uh, so we have the crocidolite, the blue asbestos. Um, South Africa produced 97% of the world uh, asbestos, uh, the crocidolite asbestos. 100% uh, of the amosite, and by the way, amosite stands for uh, asbestos mine of South Africa. And uh, it was the fifth larger producer of uh, chrysotile asbestos. Uh, in 1977, uh, South Africa was the third biggest uh, manufacturer and uh, exporter uh, of asbestos worldwide. Um, so this is a, a typical <laughs> picture from an asbestos mine. As you can see, it's, uh, it's quite a quite a, a small operation and you can see the blue uh, coming out quite strongly here in this picture, the crocidolite asbestos. Um, there were very primitive methods and lack of uh, enforcement and also ignorance that led to um, what we can call today, you know, the legacy uh, that asbestos left, left behind in this country. Um, this uh, picture, I'm not sure when exactly it was taken, maybe in the 60s, around about there, uh, showing uh, the process that is called cobbing, and this is manual separation of the asbestos uh, from the rock, and uh, it's a manual operation uh, really done by just hitting the rock and separating the fibers. And as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of exposure there. Uh, and, and as you can also see from the picture, these uh, ladies were not using any kind of protection. Uh, often they were actually uh, not official workers um, uh, from, from any mining company. And often they were having children with them as well. Um, asbestos um, created a very, very large um, amount of 
contamination in the environment and around the mines and also around uh, transportation routes, especially railways and roads. And um, in 2013, 2014, the National Institute for Occupational Health in South Africa, uh, we did a survey to actually investigate the amount of asbestos contamination along railway lines. And we um, focused on 11 sites, 11 railway stations, where we measure the contamination both on the ground and also the presence of asbestos fibers in the air. And we found both. We found um, a lot of hot spots where asbestos was clearly visible uh, on the ground and also quite a large uh, proportion of the air samples that we took and were analyzed with electron microscopy. We found uh, especially crocidolite and amosite fibers in the air, which was concerning. Um, as South Africa was quite, quite um, important, it played an important role in asbestos research. And um, this is a, on the left, you can see an article that was published in 1928, as far back as that, and describing pulmonary asbestosis in South African uh, miners. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, an article that was mentioned before uh, from Wagner and others describing 33 cases of uh, mesothelioma, which had a history of uh, exposure to blue asbestos. And it was really a strong link that was created uh, between um, asbestos exposure and mesothelioma. The sad part of the story, of course, is that um, government as well as industry uh, did not really uh, listen to the message that came from research and production continued until the late 1970s where there was a decline in, in worldwide uh, demand uh, of asbestos due to a uh, banning of the asbestos and legislation that came into, into place. Asbestos uh, today in South Africa, we have around 200 mesothelioma cases that are reported a year. Um, a lot of people think this is probably the tip of the ice uh, due to underreporting, misdiagnosed. And also we must remember a lot of those workers that work on South African mines were actually coming from neighboring countries, migrant workers, that went back to their original countries and nobody really knows um, that they died of, of mesothelioma or other, other asbestos related diseases. It's, it's never been recorded here. Um, asbestos is really widespread in asbestos containing material and especially roofs. There's one estimate that over a million asbestos cement roofs, and this is only in, in the government low cost housing projects uh, that are out there. Uh, we recently promulgated um, the, what is called the asbestos abatement regulations, where there is a lot of emphasis on training awareness, identification and health risk assessment for asbestos. Um, we currently don't really have a national asbestos management program, but uh, the National Institute for Occupational Health is a key player uh, in terms of raising awareness, training, risk assessments, and also uh, uh, being part of formulating those future national plans for management of asbestos in, in this country. And I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And I'm pleased to say David Goldsmith's here. He'll be taking over as moderator now and introducing Dr. Trump. Thank you very much for the visit. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pond, today uh, invite me to join our web. Uh, uh, this first time I joined uh, with the group, and I want to. Uh, uh, 
present about the current front uh, of apartheid in Vietnam. Uh, apartheid in Vietnam is more than, uh, we have data about more than 60 years. Uh, since uh, to, uh, 1963, uh, we have uh, uh, two companies from Italia and Hong Kong come to Vietnam to uh, build the AC uh, company in Vietnam. And after that, we uh, uh, use a lot of Abetot in Vietnam. After 1975, uh, a lot of uh, AC ship product uh, in uh, have in Vietnam. And uh, uh, now we have a, a big kit uh, factory in Hanoi. Uh, in uh, 2008, uh, the product of AC roof uh, seat uh, reached uh, in uh, high heat capacity in uh, Vietnam about more than 100,000 square meter roof seat by uh, 50 uh, factory. And Muse and Bry uh, member Vietnam group. And uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, document to uh, uh, prepare for Ben uh, Apetot in Vietnam. The new read uh, document we um, uh, rem on uh, to 2022 on remind project brought up stop using grid uh, uh, protein uh, to stop product at the top proofing seat from uh, to 2023 uh, and uh, now uh, we are prepared to uh, stop uh, uh, the product and uh, we have uh, import a lot of uh, apartheid uh, a year. You can see we uh, seen to uh, uh, 1992, we import more than uh, 10,000 tons. And uh, uh, to uh, uh, 2012, we uh, import the most uh, apartheid in Vietnam. And now, uh, 2020 and 2021, we uh, 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 import only 20,000 ton uh, in Vietnam, and we reduce the uh, import uh, apetot to Vietnam. And uh, almost uh, apetot we import from Russian, uh, more than 85%. Uh, uh, and uh, we uh, import uh, in U from uh, USA, China, Kazakhstan, and Canada. This data we collect from uh, 2011 and 2012. Uh, in Vietnam, we have uh, a domestic product, uh, Apestot, but therefore no Apestot fiber product in Vietnam. And uh, we uh, have estimated about 370,000 uh, uh, tons a year. Uh, and uh, now we have a uh, expo with Apestot in the Apestot cement product about seven uh, and 19 million mass square. We uh, use how which I say roof in most area. The um, percentage transport mean content abetot, we don't have any uh, data, but uh, now in uh, Vietnam, we have uh, more than uh, 20,000 motorbike and uh, more than 700 motorbike still use bread and uh, content abetot. Um, uh, we have uh, more uh, in uh, 2010, uh, we uh, have uh, more than 8,000 8, workers at work Expo, which are based on in uh, uh, 54 companies, almost a uh, Beto cement uh, factory. But now uh, we uh, have only 20. Uh, one factory, uh, Abetot factory, and more than 2,000 pe people exposed with Abetot uh, in that company. And uh, we uh, reduce a lot of uh, worker exposed uh, with uh, Abetot. Uh, the data of uh, Ms. Uh, Abetot related disease in Vietnam is the same as another country. We still don't have uh, the database, but we have uh, the data from 2000. Trend, uh, 12. The Metsoria, we have 46 cases, and the lung cancer, uh, 342 cases. Almost uh, exposed with uh, Abetot, we uh, collect from the hospital. Uh, 
Việt Nam uh, now we are still very difficult with the diagnosis uh, of related disease. Uh, we still develop only two diagnostic, uh, diagnostic uh, certain area for abetose related disease. It's uh, uh, silicosis and uh, mesothelioma. Uh, the diagnosis with uh, abetose we uh, uh, use uh, uh, chest x-ray but now in vietnam we still don't have any doctor have a certificate with be reader uh, we uh, still is very difficult to dilute uh, one of the most uh, difficult with us we uh, have we don't have any histopathology that my any abetose body uh, and uh, uh, we couldn't find any abetose body uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the diagnosis of uh, mesothelioma is still very difficult with us. Uh, we use cl clinical chest x-ray, CT, and MRI. And, uh, and uh, one most important, we use uh, immunocyte chemical stand for uh, mesothelioma. But uh, the technical is still is not uh, developed in Vietnam. And uh, we are very Significant to uh, diagnose mesothelioma. Uh, this first time I uh, joined for, with the group, and uh, I want to uh, develop a cooperation with the apatite working group support of Vietnam to prevent apatite related disease. And uh, in my city, we prepare to build center to record uh, tracking apatite related disease in Vietnam. And uh, we hope have a support prepare for Dr. Vietnam to get be read the certificate and uh, maybe we hope uh, for training from doctor in Vietnam how to diagnose appetite related disease and uh, this uh, very short information and uh, I thank you very much for attention thank you thank you very much um I am very grateful for uh, the large uh, turnout and attendance. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Priyanka Roy, who's gonna uh, share with us uh, some updated information uh, about her um, outstanding work. Go ahead, Dr. Roy. Uh, so I, I will uh, just uh, show you some pictures what I have got uh, during my inspection in uh, asbestos factories. So first, these are the, yeah. so uh, the import of asbestos, this is happening here also from Russia and Brazil mostly, and also from Kazakhstan. Those factories, they uh, import chrysotile fiber. Now, this is the picture of inside fiber sheet making factories. I, as I already discussed, they use this fiber sheet making factories. So I'm also putting this too. You can see uh, they are working inside the factory. They are basically making the uh, asbestos sheet for roofing purpose. So that is the only one kind of factory we have now. So they, those are the factories uh, workers working without any kind of PP. So this machine is called pulverizer. This pulverizer is uh, used for crushing of old asbestos sheet and making them into almost powder form. So you can see this powder is there and this is open. Uh, they put it inside the that sack and there are like so many uh, these open sacks are there stored and I asked them that what is the use or reuse of this powder. They told me that we use 20% of the old powder and 80% from the fresh uh, asbestos fiber. So that's how they are making their that, uh, that cement thing for their sheet making. And this is also a picture you can see that all everywhere like Behind the main factory, you can see all everywhere this kind of broken sheet. 
they are collected uh, from various sources and these are the, the, the bags as i already told and this is the asbestos fiber enclosed chamber so they showed me that uh, we are very careful about the that whether this fibers is in the air so air so that we keep it inside a closed chamber but practically we can see like the outside of the factory where the most dangerous threat are there yeah so this is uh, the eating and resting place workers this is not very clear picture because of that shadow uh, but uh, you can just understand how like they don't have any resting place or any uh, place where they can eat their food so they are just doing it outside the factory and here the uh, that sacks are there containing fibers and dust and this is this particular that this worker is casual worker under contractor and he is using broom for cleaning most of the uh, like you can see that contractual workers and uh, that uh, casual workers they are putting in that uh, cleaning or housekeeping job yeah. here is also the same thing and how they are handling as mr fiber cement sack inside the factory premises and what i already discussed that the quality of x ray those are non readable so you can see just uh, like how this is the quality of picture of x ray plates and it's almost impossible to anybody to identify whether there is any problem related to asbestos fibers so those kind of uh, thing we encounter inside when during our inspection so thank you i already discussed the issue and um, thank you very much dr roy this is this is very important uh work and um, you're to be congratulated for uh, really uh, showing us what's going on on the front lines in India. Uh, no question that um, this is something that we need to address. No question about it. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left, so we've actually stayed on time uh, as, uh, to everyone's credit. And th this is an opportunity uh, to explore uh, questions and uh, uh, also get ourselves ready for the next webinar. So I'm thinking maybe Kevin Hedges, would you like to start and talk about webinar two and, and three that are coming up so people know that's coming and then we'll we'll deal with uh, whatever questions are remaining. We've dealt with a lot of them in the chat and but I would ask if people have additional questions, put them in the chat and in fact, you might even be able to unmute you so you can uh, ask your question. But let's start with Kevin, uh, where we go from here. Okay, um, thanks everybody. Um, as you can um, hear that this is a global problem. Um, we've had some fabulous information shared. The idea is to just look at the cross fertilization we can get from, you know, all this amazing, the amazing speakers, the amazing work. So the, 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 the idea for webinar two, um, which will be the 21st of June, will be a, more around prevention. And so Dr. Emil Tompa, um, we'll talk about the methodology used in Canada to assess the financial burden. Um, and um, Dr. Demir has actually touched on that and we'll provide more information on that. That hopefully countries that still use asbestos, you know, they can use that information to, uh, to, to ban it. Um, we also, um, there's a fellow called Barry Castleman and it se seems like he hasn't been able to chime into this webinar. He's also going to be providing an update um, and also talk about national programs for elimination of asbestos. Uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Christine Oliver actually work with Dr. Oliver from the Occupational Health Clinic for Ontario Workers. She'll also be talking about early detection. Um, there's, a, there's a group called Asbestonomy that's just uh, started. And there, there are a lot of scientists that are talking about measurement. Um, they're kind of more focused, they're, they're kind of French, Belgian background, and they've kind of quite strong on um, 
electron microscopy as well. Um, and then Tuan Ning, who's the uh, WHWB um, US lead, is going to host a series of speakers from the UK, Canada. We've got Anya Keefe um, talking about assessing the need for a national standard across Canada. We've got the WHWB lead from Australia, Jason Green, providing an update from Australia. We're, we're going to be looking more at the legislation in Vietnam. Um, and, and we're trying to get um, somebody from the United Nations, a rapporteur um, from the United Nations to speak as well. Um, we're also gonna be touching on advocacy. We've, so we've got the Australian People for Health Education and Development Abroad, the Asian Ban Asbestos Network, Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. Um, and then we're very lucky to have um, the president elect from the International Occupational Hygiene Association Samantha Connell has agreed to present. Um, we've also got a board member um, who leads Osh Africa, Eki Idan, is going to present as well. And, and it seems like um, Eric Jonkier um, from Belgium is going to be talking about um, the book, Asbestos, My War with the Devil's Dust, a new, new book. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We're still trying to tease out the program, but that kind of gives you a flavor. Um, I don't have any much time left because I know we want a, a little bit of room. The idea for webinar three, it's more around measurement, um, talking about the limitations of measurement. And we also want to kind of factor in um, uh, risk management, risk assessment. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a paper about an app from Australia um, where you can actually look at the condition of asbestos and you can give it a, a risk ranking. But uh, we also kind of want to look at the different kinds of asbestos deformed minerals as well. Um, so it's a lot more technical and that's webinar three. Um, back to you, Alec, thanks Thanks for that. Can I just I have a question? add, add, add oh, to what you were saying, uh, Dr. Hedges? Um, someone asked me or asked the group about um, where we can find more on mesothelioma epidemiology. And I want to strongly recommend um, for everyone to uh, uh, consider the uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer Monographs. They have been repeated over the years, and the mesothelioma issue has been thoroughly addressed uh, by the IARC monographs. I'm trying now to see if I can um, quickly uh, send a note to everyone. Um, about how to uh, access this. I am certain that they are publicly available, um, but that is really uh, where occupational epidemiology and the understanding of workplace exposure and the link between industrial hygiene sampling and mesothelioma risk has been very well uh, laid out. And I strongly recommend everyone um, who's on this webinar uh, to take advantage of the superb work that the IARC has done in this area um, to get more up to speed. And I just wanted to um, put that out there so that people know this is a fabulous and very well-researched uh, source uh, of up, current up-to-date information, obviously depending on uh, when was the last time that the IARC um, uh, discussed um, the mesothelioma risk and other cancers, by the way. So just wanted to um, uh, make everybody aware of that. So we have a question from Gina Hidalgo that Audrey Cunningham has responded to already. The question is, uh, I've seen in some countries specific professionals for asbestos awareness with specific qualification. I haven't seen that here in Peru. What do you think we as a middle income country are missing? And I'm wondering if Audrey, you could expand just a little bit more on the training available. And then uh, if there's someone from the panel or perhaps it looks like Arthur's interested, uh, what else we can do to help address that gap? So maybe start with Audrey really quick and then Arthur, maybe you wanna follow up? Yeah, I don't I don't think I responded to that, Alex. I'm not sure uh, who you're talking about. Oh, it's, it's your, your response is right after the question. Oh, okay. um, Let me go look. what time is the question? That's weird. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Yeah, it's, it looks like somehow Zoom has put the question before your, um, uh, which was after your, your answer. <laughs> I want to speak about the training and uh, then we'll get to Arthur. 
Audrey, you want me to speak about the training? Yeah, yeah I don't know anything right. about it. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm the training coordinator. I, I wish Sorry, I Ellie. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> sure. Sure. Perfect. And by the way, Audrey uh, is doing a great job in the chat responding to people. And uh, so keep asking questions. One of us and Marianne has responded. So it's fantastic. Um, uh, what, what we're doing, what we WHWB uh, is doing is we're offering training uh, around the world virtually. And it we currently are currently are offering three different classes. Um, we are offering a basic occupational health and safety awareness course. Um, we do that primarily for people who have degrees. What we're finding is people are very well educated around the world, um, but they don't have any health and safety training. I Meaning they may be engineers, um, but they don't have any health and safety training. So we offer a basic awareness class uh, we also offer an occupational safety and health inspectors class. In fact, we have one starting next Wednesday. Um, that also covers, but is more, um, 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 more information about uh, industrial hygiene in the first two sessions and then safety in the last five sessions. And then we do offer an occupational health training course. And I mean, that's just it from soup to nuts. Um, it's, fairly, it, it's fairly basic because we are training people, as I say, who do not, who are not industrial hygienists and have not received any training um, in that area, nor is there educational opportunities in their area. And if there are opportunities, they're very expensive. So our training tends to be at no cost. It's all volunteer professionals. Uh, what I mean is everyone that I'm involved with right now has meaning in the training, uh, there are CIHs, there are master's degree level CIHs, there are PhDs um, and in all um, uh, levels of their career. And um, anyone who wants to get involved meaning helping us train, um, you know, send us, a, send us a, a note in the chat. Anyone who wants to receive training or have a group of people that want to receive training, send us a note. Uh, I will point out that Marianne Levitsky and our healthcare group just offered a noise course. So that was fairly high level. It was very focused on one occupational hazard. Um, we're, we're growing this program, um, but it is virtual and it is a study at your own pace with a weekly tutorial. The reason we do that is our students have jobs for the most part, families, other responsibilities. So we have found that this blended um, process of training has worked very well. So um, that's all I have to say, Alec. And please ask questions if you have any. We, we've had a number of questions about how to join the WHWB Healthcare Group. Um, who's, the, who's the contact for that now? It looks like it's... It can, I can be the contact because the chairs okay. aren't on the call, I don't think. So but, just... Marianne, uh, what, what's your email? I, I, putting, I'm going to put it in the chat. I'll put my personal email in the chat because it's better than putting the, the WHWB mailbox okay. tends to get overloaded yeah. <laughs> so here's my personal email in the chat uh anybody who's interested in any of our programs healthcare group training anything else volunteering donating you can get in touch with me um arthur did you want yeah, to comment on i, the, I on wanted the to comment yeah, yeah it, it, it turns out you know especially in in parts of the developing world even in the the more industrialized countries there's not at this point in time that I'm aware of a whole lot of training specifically uh, on asbestos related disease. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, a better thought it is for individuals to uh, get broader training in occupational medicine or occupational safety and health. I'm delighted to learn that the uh, uh, WHWB is, is uh, 
uh, offering such courses. You know, there are some materials uh, uh, in print. Uh, I think uh, the WHO, though I have some concerns about some of their written materials, uh, have some uh, things. Some countries, India, for example, I just it was over there two weeks ago teaching for a week. It's a three-month course for uh, qualified physicians who want to become occupational physicians to get uh, certified in a place like India uh, to become uh, occupational physicians. But worldwide, even here in the United States, we have a real dearth of uh, individuals who want to go into the field. We only train probably about 100 people a year. We don't even replace the people that are getting out of the field. Um, so it, it, the training opportunities around specific issues uh, like asbestos are, are not that common. Uh, I, I believe he's, he's participating in, in on uh, the group at uh, colleague in Colombia organized, uh, as I said earlier, uh, two of my Brazilian colleagues and I to come teach for a week on just the ILO uh, uh, classification about asbestos and other diseases. But since I've got the floor, there's two other comments I want to make. Uh, uh, David, I appreciate your comment about IARC and its data on mesothelioma, but even they have only good data for the countries that have good collection. And in, in the same meeting that Alec mentioned, uh, the mesothelioma meeting in Lille, which is coming up at the end of the month, I'll be giving a presentation at the opening plenary on the uh, uh, epidemiology of mesothelioma at that. And it really depends on uh, what country you're in. Uh, as Paul, one of Paul's slides showed, the, the Russians have a huge amount of use, but very few mesos, and that's because, you know, it's not accurate data. And so uh, uh, I, I think whatever data exists, it's going to be a gross underreporting. The last comment I want to make, uh, our colleague from Vietnam was, was talking about uh, there was nobody to to look at asbestos bodies and tissue, or that wasn't a, an experience that pathologists were aware of. I want to reiterate that that is a phony and an inappropriate measure for asbestosis that's been promulgated by insurance-related physicians. Um, Germany has a long history of, of requiring uh, either fiber counts or asbestos body counts. Some of pathologists here in the United States have promulgated that. The problem, as I said in my remarks, is that chrysotile doesn't form asbestos bodies, and it leaves the lung at a much faster rate than amphibole. And so it is a phony, inappropriate, scientifically unsupportable uh, part of a diagnosis of asbestosis. It really comes down to a history and, and radiographic changes, not what you find in tissue. Um, the other reason uh, is people have said chrysotile doesn't cause mesothelioma because they don't find it in the lung, but uh, many studies have shown that 80% of the fibers in the pleura in cases of mesothelioma are actually chrysotile because it translocates there much more easily than amphiboles. Amphiboles will cause mesos, of course, as well. Uh, but I, I just caution all of my colleagues around the world not to be sucked in to this uh, inappropriate science that has been pushed by um, industry forces. And I'll leave it at that. So we've reached 9.30, and that's the official end of the webinar. But the tradition of WHWB web webinars is that if people want to stay a little bit longer, I'm certainly available. And anyone who uh, must leave, obviously feel free to leave. But if we want to carry on a conversation a bit longer, but knowing that some people have already given two and a half hours of their time to this marvelous webinar, I want to thank everybody who participated. We're trying to model a global approach. I believe we succeeded. We're trying to model a collaborative science-based approach. I believe we've succeeded. There's lots more work to be done. Kevin just posted the information for our June 21st webinar and our July 12th webinar. That information is also um, freely available in the distributions that we're making. And I want to ask Marianne a question, if it's possible, if we could send a follow-up in a couple of days or whenever appropriate to the people who registered for this program that would have a link to the uh, presentations when we sort of got them all in uh, one place. And also 
some standardized information on who to contact about uh, various issues. You think that's uh, uh, possible? Because I, I think yes, there have been a lot possible. of questions. And what, what we usually do, assuming every, and if anybody's not okay with sharing your slides in PDF format, uh, please send me a message about that. Otherwise, we will PDF them and make them available. Um, what we usually do is uh, post the recording on our YouTube channel and in the YouTube notes link to a folder with all the slides. But Alec, if you want to send everybody a message, yes, you can do that as well. So are some people able to stay another 15 minutes or so to continue the conversation? If so, anyone who needs to leave, leave, and then we will close at 945. And uh, there is a question here about the ingested asbestos. Is Paul DeMere still here? I'm not sure he is. I can address that if you want, Alec. Let's do that, Arthur. Uh, Julian Branch has raised the question and it's, yeah, I, I know it's on uh, the minds of a number of people in the group. It's become a, a significant issue, not only in Canada, where there's been a lot of use of asbestos cement pipe, but in uh, England and a few other places. As a physician who spent more than 50 years studying asbestos, I'm very concerned about ingestion of asbestos. First of all, uh, there's growing evidence of gastrointestinal tract and kidney cancers uh, in the literature. So that is a uh, root by ingestion. Uh, we also know that fibers that get into the colon will transmigrate through the bowel wall into the peritoneal cavity, which is one of the ways that uh, peritoneal mesotheliomas can occur. Uh, there's not a lot of study, uh, both in humans and animals, on ingestion, unfortunately. Uh, I did some animal work years ago and got some colon cancers from the ingestion of asbestos in uh, rats. So uh, that's uh, something, uh, part of my background. Uh, but uh, the only country in the world that has a standard for water uh, asbestos fiber content is the United States at 7 million fibers per liter. No other country that I'm aware of has a standard. Uh, that standard in America was not set with any good scientific basis. Uh, and I just think this is another source, uh, unappreciated and underappreciated source uh, of exposure to people. and. Um, uh, this doesn't even address the issue of people making the asbestos cement pipe, putting it in place, which requires cutting it, uh, uh, creating dust, and then when it breaks down, uh, removing it. And I've seen disease in all of these people making the pipe, putting it in and taking it out. And it's not something that should ever be used again. And, and the stuff that's in the ground needs to be removed safely and disposed of properly. I'll just add something else um, for those in, uh, interested in working on the issues around ingested asbestos. Uh, Julian Branch has been very active on that in Canada. Maybe, Julian, you could post your contact information. Also, there's a complicating factor, which is that asbestos fibers in water, often uh, the water dries up, and that leaves behind fibers that can become airborne. And uh, certainly some people are quite worried about that because you can imagine settings where there's a lot of this water and it's drying up on a regular basis and perhaps there's not good ventilation. So that that adds to the complexity of dealing with um, uh, asbestos uh, in, in water contaminated by asbestos cement um, uh, water mains. So any other questions you can put up uh, your hand or um, put it in the chat. I'm, I'm continuing to monitor the chat. We really want to make sure we're answering what what's on people's minds and, and that's important to them at the front line, wherever you're working. And by the way, the um, you're now allowed to unmute yourselves. And if you, uh, you can oh, raise good. your hand with the chat, with the raise hand function, which is under reactions. It's been a long session. So, and we, we have answered a lot of questions. Yeah. So John Mullen, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And uh, maybe tell us where you're from. John, there you are. I'm from Oakville, Ontario. Okay. So here's a, a general question. Um, 
we're in the process of removing asbestos in uh, my workplace. We've taken like 50,000 pounds of asbestos out of here in the last six months. Um, we're using the glove and bag method. It's being monitored, all that stuff, all the protocols are in place. Is there still much of a risk? Like, you know, you hear all these rumors how fibers will stay in the air for 24 hours and all that stuff. Uh, let's see if we can get a Marianne, are you willing to start a hygiene answer? Or is there something? Um, yeah, something and Kevin, I'm sure Kevin maybe could. Yes. Um, well, it really depends on the ventilation. I mean, it will settle, but they don't won't settle very, very quickly. Um, so I would say it is a good, you know, rule of thumb to assume that they will remain in the air and to continue with any protective measures, respiratory protection while you're in that area until there has been a clearance monitoring to determine that it is no longer present in the air. And there probably are other hygienists on the line who might be able to elaborate on that. Yeah, you, you can't think, you know, what gets measured notice gets, what gets noticed gets action. So, you know, it, it, there are consultants that can, you can kind of call and put their pumps out and take care samples and, you know, just, just to provide that reassurance that there's, there's no leakage. It's a bit like, you know, um, checking the integrity of a, an asbestos removal enclosure by putting monitors around the outside of the enclosure. John? Yeah, no, they, they are doing that. They're, they're monitoring the air around the, the uh, um, circumference of the area that they're doing the abatement. But still, I'm just wondering, I mean, even the Beth methods, I mean, it's nothing's 100%, right? Even HEPA filters. Well, and, and that is why there is, you know, respiratory protection required. There are very strict requirements in Ontario for abatement and clearance monitoring, which means the monitoring that you have to do to say, okay, it's okay, you can take down all the controls. And John, I'd be happy to answer any more questions about that. If you want to email me, I put my email in, in the chat. Perfect. I can refer you. you to the requirements in Ontario for that. So we have another couple of questions uh, and I really want to make sure we get to them. First one I think is very easy. I'll, I'll address it initially to Arthur and it's a question. Um, uh, uh, how much percentage surety can mesothelioma be related to asbestos exposure? And it's a question from Raja Singh. And I think it's pretty easy to answer. It depends in what part of the world you're at. Uh, if it's North America, uh, Europe, it's probably close to 100%. Uh, if you're on the Anatolian plain of Turkey, you have to be concerned about uh, uh, fibrous zeolites. If you're on the slopes of Mount Etna, you have to worry about fluoroadenite as a cause. Those are three fibers that are uh, known causes. Uh, we haven't discussed the, another issue today. We know in animals, uh, uh, nanofibers will cause mesotheliomas. We have no yet, uh, no, no documented experience yet with uh, uh, humans and nanofibers, but that's certainly a potential concern uh, if proper precautions aren't being taken. But uh, uh, you know, in the absence of, of uh, those geographic areas, it should be assumed that asbestos was the cause. And uh, as another area we haven't really discussed yet today, there's a very underappreciated source of exposure to asbestos, which is the use of uh, talcum powders, which are more and more being shown to be uh, contaminated with asbestos and leading to disease. Uh, I've got a couple of papers on, on talc, one and showing that seven of 13 products available over the counter in India uh, were contaminated with uh, asbestos. And just in January this year, colleagues and I published on 166 cases of mesothelioma. Uh, everybody had used talcum powder in 44 cases. We had either documented or possible or probable other exposures, which meant that over 100 cases, the only known exposure uh, appeared to have been talcum powder use. So, um, uh, and if you look at, at, at the best data from around the world, people claim 94% males and 89-ish or so percent in females are asbestos related. And I'm sure that some of those uh, missing numbers are because people didn't know that they were exposed and couldn't report any kind of exposure. And 
questions about things like talc use probably were not made. So it uh, looks like you've also answered the next question, which is about carbon nanotube, similar risk to asbestos. So are there any other questions? Uh, we're getting close to 945, and I think we should probably wrap up at that point. Yep. Can I just uh, pose a question to everyone? Um, is it not wise for us to clearly assume that workplace exposure to asbestos is one of the most serious driving factors uh, leading to mesothelioma and other types of lung cancer. I, I, I'm asking that because um, the concern about, uh, especially a, a, asbestos in water, is uh, tends to cloud the issue. And um, what worries me is that um, we might un unnecessarily give the impression that uh, we need to be really highly focused on asbestos in water when that's really a lower, much lower risk uh, in terms of severity and in terms of, of cost um, for premature uh, cancers and other diseases. It, and I'm sort of posing this as a, a broad question for us to be thinking about. Yeah, it shouldn't be seen as either or as well, I think. Um, any other uh, questions or concerns, comments? Um, get in. Uh, um, the, you can yeah. unmute. Go ahead. Um, that um, 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 unmute. And then, Kevin, maybe you can close and welcome people to web webinar uh, two in two weeks. Uh, I think I agree with the comment that uh, this digestive uh, asbestos will probably uh, create another uh, issue that really has a much lower risk, if at all it's a risk, um, because United States is the only country which has a standard, and I don't know in the United States if there are many states who are even monitoring whether there is a compliance with that or not. So uh, I think that if we continue to, to deal with asbestos in air, and uh, that will probably be our focus, and that should remain our focus until that is properly controlled before we start going into a much lower risk uh, situation of digestive asbestos exposures. So we've got someone who's down as WHWB US branch, and then maybe Kevin can close the, uh, the, the session. Hi, this is Ton. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, okay. Ton, we yes, can hear Ton. you. Yep. Yes, uh, I would like to uh, make a comment on uh, John Mullen uh, question. Uh, when you have asbestos clean up in your facility, after the clearance sampling, uh, the acceptable level is less than 0 0.01 fiber per cc. So that means that you never literally completely clean it out. The permissible exposure limit uh, from OSHA is 0.1 fiber per cc. And, and then for the short-term exposure limit, you have uh, about one fiber per cc. So uh, for the clearance sampling, it's 0 0.01 fiber per cc. So that means you always have little residual in the air, not completely clean. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, John. And Kevin, could you close the webinar and uh, we're obviously encouraging people to come back on June 21st. Yeah, I just I just want to kind of comment too on the digestion of asbestos. I mean, there was a meta-analysis um, that was conveyed through the University of Toronto. And, you know, the risk for um, gastrointestinal cancer is a lot stronger now. And, you know, there's also lung overload, you know, being exposed to lots of dust and then getting it back into your gastrointestinal track that way that I think we need to, to think about too with digestion um, but yeah with the um, what, what I'm also doing I've been listening carefully and I've been taking lots of notes and we try and distill out you know what we learn from webinar two, one into webinar two so we did run the two webinars on engineered artificial stone that you might want to look at um, in February um, that, that's on our website it's a big issue too but I I don't think it's as big as what we talked about today, um, but we really, um, I really hope everybody on this call can chime in to the one on the 25th, of, sorry, the 21st of June, the same time as this one, the 7 a.m. 
uh, Eastern Daylight Time. And we're going to be really be talking about prevention. What what can we do to you know control the risk, reduce the exposures? So please, please attend. And I just want to thank Alex so much for spearheading this series. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be part of this. And and Marianne and all the others from uh, Jen Galvin and the president of WHWB and Twan. Um, please donate. You know, um, if you you're part of an organisation. Um, that has some money. Um, Tuan's actually organizing a conference in, um, we're helping organize a conference in Vietnam. And, and we really need some funds to help Tuan push that forward. So with, without any more um, information um, that I, I want to share with you, it'll just please listen in on the, the 21st of June. Uh, thanks, Alec, and thanks everybody. And, and, and special thanks to all of our speakers. And, yes. and, you know, and we really have one. We have one more question. Let's let's get an answer. I'm wondering if Arthur, you're willing to take on the question. Sure. Someone said a, a two week exposure in a reconstruction house asbestosis. My guess would be not too likely, but there could be danger even from that. Maybe comment on intensive short ex, short yeah. exposure to asbestos and yeah. the health effects. The odds of a, a two week exposure giving rise to disease is is pretty remote. I mean, you know, David's point about ingestion having a lower risk, I, I agree with. That doesn't mean uh, that it should be ignored. I agree with you, Alec, that, that, you know, it's not either or, it's both. And again, with limited resources, you deal with the workplace exposures first, but you, you shouldn't ignore the others. I think a two-week exposure, uh, while it carries whatever the exposure was, you know, some increased risk, it's, it's really quite small. Uh, I would caution someone not to, you know, walk around and be worried for the rest of their lives that they're going to come down. They're certainly not going to come down with asbestosis uh, from that kind of exposure. And the odds of getting a cancer uh, from a two week exposure, unless it was, you know, a huge amount uh, is, is probably pretty negligible. So on that note, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, all our presenters, everyone who gave almost three hours of your day to this event. And uh, we'll hope to see uh, most of you on June 21st and on July 12th. And perhaps there'll even be a fourth webinar. We'll have to see how this all evolves. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. And thanks very much Bye. to the Asbestos Working Group.